Hello, I, I'm Paul Peterson. I'm the uh, director of the program on education policy and governance at Harvard University and the editor in chief of Education Next. And I'm very pleased to see all of you um, for this discussion today of our latest issue of our journal, which is devoted to James Coleman and his contributions to education, most notably the Equal Educational Opportunity Report, which was le released 50 years ago this year, came out in July of 1966. So we are thinking this is a worthy opportunity to revisit the issues that he put on the nation's policy table at a time when nobody really thought seriously and deeply about what impacts did schools have, what impacts did families have, how do we eliminate inequalities in our educational system. We talked about this in general terms when we passed the Civil Rights Act of 1964. But in that law, Congress provided that there should be a study of the nation's educational system to find out what the degree of inequality was in the United States. And they asked James Coleman to lead this study. And James <laughs> Coleman took this study in directions that nobody anticipated at that time. He surveyed in two years, in a breathtakingly short period of time, he did a survey, rep representative sample of all the schools and all the students in the United States and parents, asked lots of questions of parents, students, administrators, and gave students tests to see how well they were doing and see how much difference there was between blacks and whites and whether it had to do with the kinds of schools they were attending. What were the key factors that were affecting student performance? All of that is really quite remarkable now, when I was a young professor at the University of Chicago and James Coleman was there, uh, I was told by a senior colleague that uh, a star has to have five points. And that's what he told this struggling young assistant professor trying desperately to burnish at least one little tiny point on a star. So being humiliated, I never forgot that and then so I thought about James Coleman and said is he truly a star and yes indeed he does there are five points so we're going to talk about all of them the most notable point is the equal opportunity report that we're going to focus mainly on but he did other things as well um, he wrote before that a very important book called the adolescent society in which he said you know when kids go to school in high school they focus more on games and cheerleading and um, uh, uh, homecoming queens than they do on their studies. And why is that? W what is the reason for that? And he gave a very penetrating answer to that question, which we need to rethink about. He says the competition is what stimulates kids, and they really get excited about the competition that the school is having with other schools. And in educational learning, students compete with one another. And the ones who lose don't like it, and they pick on those who achieve, and you get conflict within the school over learning when it should be the other way around. So he advocated competition between schools on academic matters as well as on football and basketball, baseball. So this idea of using games as a way of stimulating learning is an idea that we're going to pick up later on this afternoon. Uh, he also looked at d racial desegregation and white flight, and that's a topic I'm going to turn to at the end of my remarks here. Uh, and finally, he talked about public and private schools. He found that Catholic schools outperformed public schools, a finding that generated a great deal of controversy and provoked a lot of criticism of James Coleman at that time. So we're going to revisit these five points, not just look at the Equal Opportunity Report. And as you know from the journal in your hands, uh, you can explore this in greater detail because the topics that we're going to cover quickly today are explored in greater depth than the current issue of the journal that was released today. Um, 
We're also online, I should mention. Uh, so we're streaming live, and uh, we uh, hope that our uh, online audience is uh, able to hear the conversation. But that does uh, impose some obligations upon us to try to uh, use microphones when we speak so that we can communicate to as large an audience as possible. Um, so uh, I'll introduce the panel in just a minute, but there's one person who I had hoped would be able to join us today who could not, and that's Steve Rivkin, because his study um, of uh, racial desegregation uh, as it has evolved in the years since the Coleman Report was written is particularly interesting as a starting point, as a departure point. And what he shows is that there are two ways to measure segregation in our schools. One is the amount of exposure to white students that the average black student has in the United States. And if you use that as your measure of desegregation in our society, uh, the higher the bar is, the better it is in terms of the exposure of blacks to whites. And um, as you can see from this chart, um, the bars jumped up quite rapidly between 1988, uh, 1968, and uh, 1980. And this has led a number of scholars to report that segregation is getting worse in the United States. Blacks are less exposed to whites in school than they were in 1980. And it's a very significant change that has occurred over that period of time. But there's another way of measuring desegregation and how much of it we have. And that's the <coughs> dissimilarity index. Now, the dissimilarity index measures how much of a change would you have to make in order for every school to have the same racial composition, the same percentage of blacks and whites in every school throughout the country. How much of a change would we have to make? Now, in this case, we want to see the bars go down because zero is perfect integration 100 is perfect apartheid. And this is a pretty standard measure of the degree of segregation in our society. And here, when you look at this graph and you look at the school level, which is the white bars on the screen there, you see that there's a steady decline, uh, a fairly steep decline initially between 1968 and 1980, but a continuing decline after that from 71% to 65% in the most recent period for which we have information. So this is a little bit more hopeful way of looking at the degree of segregation that we have in our society. If you look at the district level, it's not that uh, hopeful. I mean, it's more of a stable picture. So what that tells you is that desegregation is occurring within school districts. But between school districts, we have as much segregation as we have had in the past, because people, the white flight phenomenon was real, and people are separating themselves within the metropolitan area into different places where segregation uh, between districts is the result. Now, why, are th what's the, why the difference between these two graphs? That's the puzzle that Steve Rivkin poses. So in the first graph that I showed you, the exposure index, the bars are going down, which is a bad sign because blacks are less exposed to whites than ever before in the past. And in the second graph, the bars are going down, the white bars are going down, there's less dissimilarity among schools than in the past, which is what something we would like to see. So why are these two measures showing us something different? Well, it's pretty clear when you look at the third graph, we don't have as many white students anymore. The percentage of white students at school 
has fallen from 80 percent to 50 percent. The percentage of black students has remained roughly the same over this period of time, but the percentage of Hispanic and Asian students has cre increased pretty dramatically. So you have less exposure to whites because you have a lot of non-whites in, in the school system uh, than you had back when Coleman was doing his work. So what Ridkin really shows in this is that if you think about the issue of segregation in our society, uh, it's not that things have become a lot better, but it's not as if things have become a lot worse either. <laughs> so the challenge for us in the future is to figure out how we can have a more integrated society by the middle of the 21st century. So today our speakers are going to talk about this issue and other issues in two panels. And the first panel begins with, uh, I'll introduce them all now very briefly because you have a bio that describes their many accomplishments in detail. And I'll just introduce them quickly so that we have as much time for substance as possible. Uh, Eric Hanushek is a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University and is a leading scholar, leading economist who has written extensively on many different topics. He was at the very first gathering of scholars to discuss the Equal Opportunity Report that James Coleman had written. Daniel Patrick Moynihan called together a group of scholars in 1967, 68, I think it was, and uh, they tried to say, what is the meaning of all of this? And uh, Rick uh, is old enough today to have been there back then. So it's a privilege to have him with us today. And our second speaker is Anna Igalate, who is a professor at the College of Education, North Carolina State University. And she's going to be exploring the impact of family background on learning because that was something that Coleman thought was extremely important. And we all know that that is a phenomenon we have to come with to grips with even in the contemporary period. And our discussant today is Irasima Salcido. Do I have that? Close enough. Close enough. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and she founded the Chavez Schools here in Washington, D.C. and. In 2009, she developed the DC Promise Neighborhood Initiative as well. So she has a, brings a practical perspective to bear on these issues. So I'm very pleased to have our first panel uh, gathered here and uh, everybody should feel free to speak either here or from where they're sitting, but I think it works a little better. You can see people better if you come over to the podium. So we'll begin with you, Eric Kanyashek. Well, thanks, Paul. <coughs> um, as Paul pointed out, the only reason I'm here is that when I was a graduate student uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, I was induced to sneak into the back of this seminar to try to figure out what the Coleman Report actually said and how we should interpret it. And it was all downhill from there. And I uh, <laughs> spent the rest of, of my career following trying to fill in some details of this. Um, somehow I think I have to uh, figure out how to get to the next. Do I do this? That didn't work. <laughs> soon, soon my tec technical helpers will get a, a presentation up. Um, what I wanted to do today is make some very general points about the Coleman Report and what, where it is after 50 years. Um, <coughs> I'll give you the conclusions first. Uh, you know, there's short attention span here in Washington. And uh, <laughs> so uh, we'll try to get the conclusions out and then a few people will stay for the details. Um, the f 
the first is simply that this was a path-breaking report, not only because it got me into education, uh, but because it changed the way we thought about education and schools. Um, the second is that um, it was rather a, a benchmark for educational policy, and it's such a benchmark that I want to emphasize here of looking at the kinds of distributional differences in performance that we see around the nation. Second, uh, thirdly, that I think many of the authors of articles in Education Next, a uh, point that they make is that there are some fundamental flaws in the analytics of the Coleman report um, so that nobody today would actually follow the procedures that Jim Coleman used and his co-authors used at that time. Um, but then I would want to look at the evidence on whether the conclusions he got in very faulty ways hold up or not or how they've changed in the research that's gone on over the last 50 years. So let me start at the top. Why do I call this a path-breaking study? Paul already hinted at it. At the time of the Coleman Report, when they surveyed students in 1965, individual schools gave some achievement tests or some IQ tests or something. But in general, there were no standardized tests that allowed comparisons across students with different backgrounds in different school systems. Coleman and his team went out and actually tested 600,000 kids, uh, grades 1 through 12, 1, 3, 6, 9, and 12, around the country in multiple uh, areas of um, reading and math and uh, ability scores. And he changed the policy discussion. This is the path, this is the major impact of the Coleman Report, I think, is that he changed the discussion not from away from whether it's what's the class size of your school or how many science labs do you have to what are the kids learning in your school here or there in other places and how can we change that. That I think is the biggest impact of the Coleman Report and it spurned uh, a large literature that uh, keeps growing now at uh, sort of exponential rates. And it's a benchmark um, for educational policy. And the part that I want to emphasize today is the original intent of the Coleman Report. <coughs> the Coleman Report called for in the 60 rights civil, uh, 64 Civil Rights Act um, really wanted to look at disparities and inequities in uh, education by race, religion, which never was looked at in the report, and, and other areas. Um, and what we found as a summary statistic, and this is a part of the Coleman report that I think got much overlooked originally and over time. But if I look at black-white achievement gaps of 12th graders, this is in mathematics, and I'm going to look at the blue bars here are by region, from uh, northwest, midwest, south, and west. Um, and the vertical axis is the number of standard deviations different white performance was from black performance. And these average out to a little over one standard deviation difference. Now that means virtually nothing to most civilized people um, when I say that. Um, but the way to put this is that the average black 12th grader was achieving at the 13th percentile of the white distribution in 1965. So let's fast forward to, not quite so fast forward, fast forward to um, 2013, 50 years later. The blue bars are 50 years later. What you see is that there have been some improvements in these, but not huge improvements, and I'm going to characterize the amount of improvement in just a second. And we get the same thing for reading. Reading's a little bit different in that the 
if I look on the left-hand side, the Northwest and Midwest had somewhat smaller achievement gaps, black-white achievement gaps in reading um, in 1965. Um, in the south, the big line in the middle was where the largest reading gaps existed, 1.3 standard deviations, and also in the west, uh, something over one. And what, you, what stands out is, well, there were some really big gains by, 19, uh, by 2013, the dark lines, particularly in the south and in the west where the achievement gaps closed. And so that's the first thing that stands out. The second thing that should stand out is that it only brought these regions down essentially to where the Northeast and the Midwest was, and the Northeast and Midwest had not changed. Okay. So what's, what's the summary of this? At the, this pace of closure over 50 year period, we can expect the reading achievement gap to close in one and a half centuries. And the math achievement gap we can expect to close in two and a half centuries. So that's the benchmark we have from the Coleman report, is that there are huge differences that I think were, were largely overlooked by people who read it. And the reason they were overlooked is that people went on to the next part of saying what is the impact of various factors on achievement of anybody and then a little bit into, into the gaps. So I'll go over that quickly, but I don't want you to leave this gra graph <laughs> or, or stop thinking about this because this to me is just a national embarrassment uh, that 50 years of attention to achievement differences have left us two and a half centuries away from what we expect. So there's significant analytical shortcomings with the report. The re what the report tried to do was to test all these kids, find out where, what their family background was, what schools they went to, what neighborhoods they were in, and try to attribute any differences in performance of students to these underlying factors. Now the statistical methods that were used are uh, um, just not up to par. They weren't up to par at the time and they, uh, um, they haven't gotten any better over time. Um, uh, the second thing that it failed to do is it tried to partition the variance and saying how much of the variation in achievement is due to families and how much is due to other things, which had two problems. One is that it wasn't, didn't give any plausible causal impact of what would happen if we changed any of these factors, nor did it tell you how much impact on achievement you could get from changing what the class size was or the resources or whatever of schools. Um, and all of these, um, I think, are, are fatal flaws for the scientific part as opposed to the intellectual framework that the Coleman report provided. Now the results, uh, what I'll do is take what are the common views of the results of the Coleman report, which still get continual attention and people re refer back to, well, the Coleman report found X. And so I'll give you what uh, the common views are and then what the current state uh, from my vantage point of the literature is on each of the points. I mean, the first point is that families uh, are the most important input and that is repeated all the time. I think the current research has been very simple on that. Families are really important. At the same time, it doesn't give us much indication of any policy kinds of actions we could take because most of us do not want to get too deeply in intervening in the family. Um, but it, that is a source of difference, no doubt about it. The second is uh, the finding that resources were not important. Um, as many of you know, this is a continuing controversial subject. Uh, but I d my own view that I think is accepted by everybody, whether they want to spend more on schools or not spend more on schools or what have you. Um, well, before I give you the, the summary, here's the, here's the evidence that I would quickly give you on this. This is 
along the horizontal axis is the increase in spending over the last 20 years on um, uh, schools or less more than 20 years. Um, so that's in real terms of inflation adjusted from zero up to uh, almost uh, $6,000, I guess is the right-hand side of uh, Wyoming um, uh, makes all states look bad in terms of spending. And the vertical axis is the gains in fourth grade reading scores on the National Assessment of Educational Progress. What you see is the yellow line is the simple regression line between those that says that there's no average relationship between the increases in spending by individual states and the increases in performance by those states. You have outliers in all places. You have up on the top left-hand corner is Florida, which actually decreased the amount per pupil it spent over this period in real terms and is the second fastest growing state in terms of achievement scores. You have Washington, D.C., where we are right today, which has spent a fair amount of money but has, in fact, gotten um, some substantial increases in performance. And then you get down to some of the uh, basket cases on the bottom, wh which you can all um, choose your favorite, I mean, where, wherever you grew up, to find your state. Uh, but the answer is that, on average, you see no uh, systematic performance, uh, a relationship between spending and achievement in terms of the gains over time. So I think that the statement that I and, and most other people move to is, well, of course you need resources to do all kinds of things. It's not that you can eliminate all spending on schools, but it makes a much bigger difference how you spend that money as opposed to how much you spend. Um, and I think that's the current state even of those who want to argue that w we could expect more achievement if we just put more money into schools. Um, then the final answer, which is really what got me into this whole business, um, and that is that schools don't matter. As a young graduate student, it struck me as a crazy argument to say that schools don't matter given the amount of attention, the amount of resources that we put into schools, that that couldn't possibly be the case. And I think that what we found in subsequent uh, research is that Coleman was correct in the following ways, and that is that <coughs> the measured characteristics of schools were not and are not systematically related to achievement. So the class size in the school, the teacher-pupil ratios in the school, or the salaries of teachers, or the experience levels of teachers, and so forth, are not systematically related to performance. At the same time, there's been an extensive amount of work that says, look, teacher quality is extraordinarily important, and that through the quality of teachers in the school, you determine the impact of schools and that you know, from a policy standpoint, if you want to change the achievement in the schools, what you have to do is change the quality of the teachers that are in those schools. Um, so what are the conclusions again? I didn't lose a single person over this. I guess that's the advantage of being first <laughs> up. That, uh, um, thank you for staying. Um, uh, so I think it was a path-breaking study. Um, it, is a bench, it provides a benchmark, particularly when we talk about distributional issues. Um, the report itself was deeply flawed, um, but that a number of the conclusions are also the conclusions of better scientific research. And the final conclusion I want to leave you with is just a summary statement. One and a half to two and a half centuries is not consistent with our view of American society and American education.
Oh, good afternoon. That's a tough act to follow. <laughs> um, so it's, it's a real privilege to be here. Um, I'm Annie Galite. Um, and as I was reflecting on sort of what to share from the, the paper I wrote about the summarizing what we know about family background and how it influences student achievement, I was reminded of a saying that we have in Ireland, um, Varami their skull Kayla. So what that means is we live in the shadow of one another. But that word skull, it's a really unusual one because it can be translated and most frequently is translated to mean shadow. Uh, but it also can just as easily be translated to mean shelter. And I think when we think about family background, it can go both ways, right? Depending on the circumstances into which a child is born, their family background can be a shadow from which they have to rise. Or for those who are lucky enough to be born into, into wealthy families with, with great advantages, it can provide shelter and stimulation and a whole host of advantages right from day one. So the purpose of this paper was really twofold. On the one hand, I was interested in sort of documenting, well, what do we know about the influence of scarcity, of family breakdown, um, and other factors to do with the child's upbringing um, on, on their educational and also their economic outcomes? Um, you know, the risks of growing up poor are great, but more importantly than just documenting the risks, what do we know about social policies that might be able to mitigate those influences? Um, and is there sort of, sort of things we can be thinking about from a policy perspective that might offer some hope? So just to, to sort of start us off, what are the factors that could explain disparities in, in student outcomes? As was very eloquently explained by Dr. Hanyashek, there is a challenge here, right? So uh, a challenge that the Coleman Report faced, but also researchers today face, is that many of these factors can be jointly determined, okay? So family background, very influential. School quality, also very influential. Disentangling the effects of both of those things, that's a challenge for researchers. Um, and if it's not done in a rigorous way with experimental or quasi-experimental research, we may risk falsely attributing causes. So that's, that's the research challenge. But one component of family background that has been shown to be influential is uh, the educational attainment level of their parents. So highly educated parents, they read more often to their children. They pose questions instead of giving orders. They give choices in conversation with their children. And they employ a more complex and a wider vocabulary when they're just having discussions with their children from a very young age. That's the, say, the direct effect of parental education. But we also know that better educated parents are in a really strong position to be strong advocates for their children. So when they're choosing a neighborhood in which to live, they're gonna take time to look at the quality of the local public schools. They're gonna have the resources to be able to make those decisions with school quality in mind. And there's also a multiplier effect. Highly educated parents are part of a social network of other highly educated in and influential individuals. And that has all kinds of implications in terms of contributing to the social capital of their children, the cultural capital, teaching them the sort of high culture activities and theater and art and music and things that professional elites value and that help their children to peer, to be cultured and to get ahead past educational gatekeepers. The other thing about it, better educated parents is that, well, they're gonna be higher up on the income ladder simply by a fact of we know that there are returns to, to receiving a college degree, to earning a college degree. And so that takes me to the second element of family background that I, I looked into, which was income. And that's an obvious one, right? Our intuition would tell us that, well, highly resourced parents are gonna be in a really strong position to offer their kids all kinds of supports, supplemental tutoring, you know, sports clubs, access to hobbies that are enriching, and, and all kinds of things. But there's also you know, the indirect effects. Parents who have the resources to buy a home in the right neighborhood buy themselves access to great schools. And there it is again, that entangling of family background and school quality, um, which researchers struggle to, to, to tear apart to, to, to in order to isolate, which is contributing. Over time, small differences in access to these kinds of resources and experiences, they can accumulate and they can result in sizable gaps before even a child starts school. The U.S. Bureau of Justice Statistics, they report that about 2% of children in the U.S. have a parent in federal or state prison, which, uh, depending on your perspective, is a large or a small number. But once you start comparing the categories by race, minority children are far more likely to experience this than, than compared to their white peers. 
And this has sort of obvious implications. You know, if mom or dad is not at home and not earning a living, well, that removes a wage earner from the home. So it's going to have a negative impact in that sense. Uh, it's also an emotional strain on the child, trying to understand that. Um, and it's, it's a struggle on the marriage. And so maybe it leads to dissolution of the parent's relationship down the line. Correlational research tells us that children with an incarcerated parent are about 50% less likely to graduate from high school. And, um, you know, it, there's other things going on there, sure. So it's also possible that parents who, who are imprisoned maybe have less education and lower income and other attributes that might be contributing to that high school attainment effect. Um, and really, there's lots of room here for development so that in the research literature so that we can better identify the causal impact of incarceration. Um, in terms of family structure, it's true that most American children still live with both of their biological or adoptive parents, but it's also true that family structures have become more diverse. About two-fifths of U.S. children experience dissolution in their parents' union by the age of 15, but this is particularly prevalent among the poor, right? The two-parent family structure is much less common um, among, among low-income families. And the struggles of single parenthood are apparent, okay? So obviously there's the resources issue. You only have one wage earner instead of two. Uh, there's the, and there are impacts on, on children's attainment outcomes. That's high school graduation, college enrollment and also their social and emotional development. Uh, Robert Putnam describes it as good night moon time. It's that enriching activities. It's hard to, to make the time for that if you're working multiple jobs and you don't have assistance with childcare. Um, and it seems that the boys are particularly affected by this. So recent research from Florida compared siblings to, um, from low income single parent families um, millions of observations over a really long time period, and they were able to show that the boys were particularly harmed. And the kind of outcomes we're talking about here are attainment outcomes like graduation, but also incidents of behavioral uh, disabilities, um, and also truancy, and um, the likelihood of becoming involved in, in serious crime as a juvenile. We can look at descriptive statistics, which shows an advantage for those living with two parents. For those children ages 12 to 17, you know, they're far more at risk of becoming suspended from school. For their younger peers, ages 6 to 11, those who live with one parent or a guardian, far more likely to repeat a grade. And these are just descriptive statistics. There's nothing causal here, but it certainly raises some troubling statistics and tr troubling patterns. So what are the policies that offer the most promise? to sort of counter these, these problems. Policies that will ensure that children are academically prepared, sure, but also that they have social s skills to be strong and independent adults with successful careers and also strong and nurturing relationships of their own. It, it's, uh, you know, we have, to be, we have to be realistic here. We have to be acknowledge that schools alone, it's unlikely they're gonna be able to level these inequalities but it would be naive to assume that there's nothing that they can do to sort of mitigate the influence. Um, the most promising policies are those that are gonna be working to strengthen family bonds. Um, and we should also appreciate the value of existing institutions that also tap into, um, that allow us to tap into organizations that are, are playing a role in compensating for disadvantage. Nonprofits, working in communities, churches, religious groups, um, and other agencies of civil society that um, are already doing wonderful work and working with marginalized populations. And as we think about these types of policies, I think it's helpful to take a pipeline approach. There is a very often cited statistic that by the age of four, there's this 30 million word gap that toddlers that grew up in certain households have heard 30 million fewer words in their home environment. That's a really startling statistic. So a really ambitious policy to address these types of disadvantage or promised neighborhoods. Um, many of you are probably familiar with them, but in case you're not, um, it's neighborhoods that incorporate a, a comprehensive continuum of education programs and family and community supports. They model themselves as cradle to career programs. They target areas like education, housing, um, neighborhood revitalization, crime reduction. And um, I'm not enough of an expert, we'll uh, definitely look forward to hearing more about Promise Neighborhoods from our next speaker. But I do think that they offer some promise. 
Another area of policy to, to consider here is early childhood e experiences. These are, this is the time when the building blocks for literacy and numeracy are laid that future education will build upon, but also children are, are given a chance to develop those soft skills like their resilience and their, their grit and their curiosity. Um, and, and it's a really important time to develop them because thanks to MRI scanners, we've learned a whole lot more about how the brain develops and, and how it works. And, uh, you know, through analysis of brain injury and uh, brain imagery, uh, neuroscientists have been able to develop a critical period of anatomical neurodevelopment, growth and stuff in the brain. And it just turns out that, you know, this critical period corresponds to a dramatic period of language development. And so it seems there's these windows of opportunity. Around the t uh, time a child is three or four, that window starts to close. And so that's the opportunity there in those early years to build the early building blocks for language development. It would be a shame if we don't capitalize on those important and influential opportunities. I also highlight schools of choice, and I, I stress small schools of choice because I think it combines two interesting sets of literature. Um, and, you know, Coleman wrote about social capital. I think schools of choice are uniquely positioned to develop social capital. Um, they're voluntary communities to begin with, and they, they consist of people with shared values, um, and they're particularly well situated to help children develop dense networks of social ties with other people in the community. I, I don't mean to imply that there aren't great traditional public schools. There are, and for children who are lucky enough to go to them, that's fantastic. My husband is a teacher at one and, and looking for those kids. But school choice policies offer a way to take a look out of the equation. Okay, it's a way for <coughs> deprived children who don't live in great neighborhoods to be able to attend the school that they would like, the school that's going to be the best fit for them. So schools, I totally admit, they might not be, probably are not, fully capable of addressing or compensating for the influence of family background. But that's not to say there isn't a role for them to play in mitigating some of that influence. Uh, when families fail, schools can serve as places of sanctuary, support, and they can offer shelter. With schools as their center, social policies described here can give disadvantaged students strength and resources to stand on their own. And as a final note, I just think I want to re-emphasize the value of tapping into pre-existing organizations that already do an excellent job of reaching out to and working with marginalized communities. Good afternoon. I'm very honored to be here and very, very thankful for this opportunity. I'm going to do my best to share with you um, answers to the two questions, I guess, that were posed for, for today's theme. Why is it that we have not made some, you know, much progress in the last 50 years since the report was published? And what are the kinds of things we need to be thinking about for the future? And as you can imagine, I'm going to give it from the perspective of my experience. I, uh, um, I came to this country as a teenage and experienced our school system as an immigrant student. As well, I have spent most of my uh, life in education, the, the last 25 years here in Washington, D.C. So I consider myself a D.C. 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 person um, because I, I worked here for 25 years, nine years in a traditional public school and 16 years, uh, you know, creating Chavez and uh, running Chavez. Um, I'm not retired at home with uh, five of my children, so it's been great to have done the work and very lucky to have been able to do that, but uh, I'm also very blessed that I can be home with uh, my children, that it was really hard to be there for them during <laughs> those years. So I have had the chance to really reflect on my 20 years in education per se and all that is, has happened around those 25 years. So I'm gonna try to just really quickly summarize or give you in general uh, terms what the things that I believe have gotten in the way and then what I think we need to do. Uh, I hope it's okay, I'm not gonna get into much detail regarding you know, exactly what I did at Chavez or the DC Promise Neighborhood Initiative, and I'd be happy to answer questions regarding that during the, the answer, question and answer um, 
period. So when I reflect on all this, there's six things that I believe have gotten in the way of us making more progress. One, I think it has been very, very difficult to overcome our country's history of discrimination. We can think of the 1960s and the segregation and all those things that have made it so hard to bring equality. I think that's just very difficult to do. Also, we learned because of the change of the student population being more diverse, that schools, um, it's very difficult for, for the schools and to address the educational needs and social needs of such a diverse student population from the language needs, the skills, you know, lack of skills, uh, you know, you can name them on and on what those needs are. And also we learned that money and laws are not enough just to throw money at the problem, mandates here and there, you know, it just, it's just not enough. Um, also, our inability to address poverty and address all the social ills that come with it that unfortunately prevent a lot of our young people from achieving their potential. We just have not been able to, to really do better in that area. Um, the other, the next one, I don't know how you feel about what I'm going to say, but um, I think our love for innovation and research is our greatest blessing and our greatest curse. I think that sometimes we just let that dominate the problem or dominate what's going on, and sometimes we just get lost on that in, in don't recognize that it has to come a point where we really compare or test out reality with those things. And it just seems to me that reform after reform and study after study, it's very important to have it. We need that information, but I just think that sometimes that can get in the way of really continuing to stay focused on what the pro problem is. And the last one, uh, which I think is obvious to hopefully all of us, is just that it has hurt us, it will continue to hurt us to make education a political issue. It just, you know, we want fast answers, we want, depending on who's in office or what's going on, change after change, and that disrupts schools, disrupts education, and, and we don't see consistency, and that hurts our kids. So those are the things that I have had a chance to reflect on. And Good news and bad news. I guess the bad news, I think all of you here agree that those continue to be challenges and probably some of them at a higher levels. When you think about it, just poverty issues. So they continue to be challenges for us. But the great news is that I think we care enough and we have learned enough the past 50 years on what works or what has the potential to work. I think the fact that we had had to challenge ourselves with a lot of these policy questions that we continue to strive for the ideal of making sure that every single child in America is in a, the best school possible to help them develop their potential. That's what keeps us going and I believe truly and deep in my heart that that's what's gonna get us to where we need to be. I think we want it and we're gonna get it done. Now what is it that that we want. I think by now, based on my experience, and you could all agree, I'm assuming all of you, or most of you, uh, depending your age, uh, perhaps have children. Um, if not, you've gone to schools or have, you have a knowledge of what a good school is. So to me, how do we create schools like this all over the country? We know they exist in traditional schools, charter schools, and private schools. One, that every single school is safe and every adult in that school has high expectations for all students to achieve high academic standards and to pursue post-secondary education. We want all schools to teach our students critical thinking skills, problem-solving skills, and prepare them to be good, engaged citizens. We want to have at each of those schools, competent, responsible, 
caring administrators and teachers. We want schools that are gonna honor families, welcome them, engage the communities, so together we can address anything that is getting in the way of the education of the student, no matter where they are. I think the schools, that's one of the reasons I decided to create Chavez, and one of the reasons I decided to launch the DC Promise Neighborhood um, Initiative, because I felt all those elements were necessary. So I think uh, our job is to think of how do we set up the conditions or the systems in place to see that these schools are created. And a lot of this, this is like, this is like st high school students would say like, duh. I mean, it's, I think it's, it's obvious, right? I believe it's obvious. One, I think we have to be willing to prepare, retain, and protect people that work at the schools, especially our administrators and teachers. The way we're preparing our principals and teachers right now in our universities is not cutting it. We have to have rigorous, competitive programs where those that are pursuing teachers would feel that this, this is what they have to do, and not only that is the best program available to them, but also to retain them, we would have to also pay them well. Pay them well in order for them to want to come into teaching and stay in teaching. I think that's really important, as, you know, as well with, with our principals, because their, their role, the principals and the teachers, are key to creating these uh, schools that I have outlined for you. Second thing we have to be willing to do is to engage our families and communities in decision-making process, as well as as teachers and staff. Unfortunately, I believe the way we run schools or the way we go about solving problems in education, we isolate and do our own thing. Research here, and I'm gonna do research that is gonna affect the lives of this group here, but at the end of the day, the ones that have to do the work and have the impact the lives of kids, many times we don't trust them enough, we don't include them in the decisions that we have to make to make schools what we know they can be. And I just hope that after this 50 years, we can all step back and humble ourselves and ask ourselves, what's important here? You know, it's not about winning a contest or who would produce the best report or who, you know, what political figure, you know, wants to have, you know, like be recognized for doing the best job. It, it, it means we humble ourselves and it means we have to act like we're there to serve the schools, the administrators and the teachers, and that we're gonna address the external factors all this thing, the things that I mentioned to you at the beginning, we have to do something about those things so the teachers and principals can do their job and that we're gonna trust them, respect them, and pay them what they deserve. And I truly believe that if we can just say, okay, we have the information, we have the last that can help us do, do this, now the question, do we have the heart to come together and just figure out how do we make sure that we create the schools that I described in every single classroom in America? It's gonna be hard, believe me, in the past 25 years. Um, still was trying and I still, it, it's hard work, but it's the right direction to go. So that's what I have to share, given in my years of experience. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. <coughs> Thanks to all of our speakers for their comments and for their sticking to the time schedule because it gives us all an opportunity to continue the discussion. So why don't I open it up now? Um, please, uh, if you may have a remark, uh, make sure it concludes with a question, not an exclamation <laughs> point. Uh, and, uh, identify the person that you would like 
to respond to the question. So does anybody? Um, yes. Just wait for the mic here. Yep. Thanks. For, so the question for Eric about the sort of the context of the release of the port in 66, you know, I, I remember um, uh, hearing about a nation at risk and the kind of the controversy that that created essentially because the findings weren't what a lot of people were expecting. And I wonder if you could talk about um, sort of the, the, the political atmosphere in 66 and how well it comported to what people were expecting. I saw a light on, I thought they worked, but uh, it was the light saying I had to do something. Um, <laughs> um, <coughs> I think that the, um, the report was released on July 3rd, a Friday afternoon, uh, which was obviously intended to make sure that nobody covered it. And the report itself is 737 pages um, of dense statistical tables, so nobody there's a few of us masochists who have read the whole thing, but not many. Um, and um, I think part of it was nervousness about how it would be received. Did it, in fact, undercut ideas of the 1965 uh, Elementary and Secondary Education Act of um, the administration uh, because it seemed to suggest that the resources were not going to be quite the answer? Um, could you interpret this as saying that desegregation was good and integration was good, which was uh, rather consistent with LBJ's policies at the time? It gave people, it was so complicated and hard to read that almost everybody could make their statement and say that it was supported by the Coleman report. So for it's a, been a long time, I think, before people have fully understood the report. But what it did do that I want to emphasize was to somehow push the idea of science and research into the policy debate. And that I don't think was ever intended, but that was the, a bigger result of it. Well, I do remember that <clears throat> Moynihan was walking across Harvard Yard and somebody asked him, the Coleman report, I hear it's coming out, what's it gonna say? And he was working with the government at the time and he said, well, it's all family. So that was the initial takeaway, I think, as uh, Anna suggested, uh, family is everything, the schools don't really make much of a difference. And I think what we've learned is that that was based on an analysis that has some problems with it. It's not that the family isn't important, it's very important, but that doesn't mean that the schools are important. And I think that's the, the big bottom line qualification uh, that um, contemporary research has placed upon the initial reaction to the Coleman report. Yes, sir. Thank you, Reggie Felton. Uh, I'd like your comments, uh, all, th all three of you or four of you, uh, regarding this whole issue of resources. For example, currently most of us see how our schools are locally funded, some state money, some federal money, typically 90% from local communities, who in many, which in many cases are just dying. I mean, the resources aren't there. Have any of your discussions dealt with some innovative way in terms of how public education should in fact be funded in this country? Ah, that's a good question. How should we fund our educational I'll system? I'll let the other people talk. I have a complete answer to that question. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'll jump in. Um, it's not quite as high as 90%. Um, it's about 10% from the federal government and then is shared between state and local sources. Um, and in many states there's been equity 
Yeah, you have to push your. Uh, so what I said real quick was um, the, the funding is about 10% from the federal government and the, and the rest is shared between state and local sources. And, and really, in a lot of states, there have been these equity and adequacy lawsuits to address the problem that you're describing, which is in a, a low-income community that may not have a lot of money coming in from property taxes to fund local education, that has been supplemented um, from state funds in order to bring up the standard of funding to more equitable level across many states. Those are some actions that have been taken through the courts. Um, perhaps you want to chime in on your complete answer on how, how exactly we, we should solve the funding question. Well, let me, let me give my outlines. Uh, I've actually written this down someplace and can show you later. But the, um, uh, I think that the state should ensure that there is a high level of base resources available to all schools that more resources go to kids that need more help, like special ed, ELL, um, disadvantaged kids of one sort or another. Um, I think that there should be some element of local choice there because you want the parents to, in fact, participate in decision making and to be interested in their schools um, in ways that they aren't if they can't affect any of the uh, funding. Um, and you want to reward success and not failure. We have a number of states today that still have school finance laws that say, if your kids do badly, we will give you more money. If they do well, we will take away money, which to an economist is offensive. Um, uh, and so you want to, in fact, reward the people that are doing what you want them to do. And finally, I think that you want to involve the parents more through uh, active choice programs and giving them an option of choosing what schools they go to and whether the schools are meeting their needs or not. Um, I should say, uh, on the overall, it's not a low, it, it can't possibly be thought of as an overall level of funding. Since 1960 to today, we spend four times as much per pupil in inflation-adjusted inflation terms uh, today as in 1960. The problem is that the performance of at least high school seniors has been entirely flat from 1970 to today. There's been no change with a quadrupling of the spending. So it's not how much, it's how. Thank you. Um, I thought a lot about this question. Um, thankfully, because of, of the creation of charter schools, I think it gave us the opportunity to show that we can create the schools that I described earlier. And because we were able to create those kinds of schools, it, that attracts funding. A lot of the charter schools, we have to go out and addition to what we receive, we have to raise additional money, which many times is not even enough. Again, if we really want to pay teachers well and principals well and bring the resources we need for, for the schools, you, you, you want to have you know, additional resources. But at the end of the day, the resources are just a tool that really want, it's going to make the great schools that we want, as I mentioned earlier, is, is the people that we put in there. How much are we willing to invest on our teachers and principals in terms of the training, engaging them in decision making, and those things that other professionals do and we don't for some reason see as much of that going in an education. To me, the bigger question, and uh, I don't know if any of you thought about this and maybe it might not make any sense to you, but it's something I've been thinking a lot about lately, now that I have time. <laughs> A little time. Um, I do think sooner or later we have to answer the following question. Do, do we believe that the main responsibility of educating our children is the government's responsibility or not? Because I think that's going to determine how we go about putting all our efforts and resources to now create every single school in America 
the way I have described it. And I think that the um, dilemma we're in right now is that school choice, school choice, and more charter schools, and districts becoming charter schools, and that's the way we want to do it. I'm, you know, I'm not saying one or the other, because we all know, and I had to learn that the hard way. You know, when I started, I was like, oh no, charter school, that's it, that's the only way. You know, don't want regulations, and what's going and you know, and, and then you realize not every charter school is successful, and, and it's not about whether charter school or, or traditional school, private school. Do we have the adults in that school that care enough about the students to make sure that they achieve high academics, all the things that I described? That's at the end of the day what happens. I do believe in terms of what we need to do as a country and unite as a country is that question. Because what worries me is that w we have this divide that just distracts. And, and I think we have to go back to the original intention that we had as a country, that one of the biggest responsibility we have is to educate our next generation. We had failed tremendously. And, and that's why the need of all the stuff that has happened since 64, and we're still failing. <laughs> so are we going to take that responsibility or not? Because it does have policy implications, and it does, in my opinion, say a lot about who we are as a country. Okay. <clears throat> yes, sir. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Philip Walker. I have the pleasure of serving as the director of a Youth Leadership Institute in Washington, D.C., which was recently named after its founder, Marion Barry. Um, um, also, uh, in graduate school, I don't know why I'm doing all this in graduate school, and then I have two kids myself, and so I think I'm just crazy. But uh, my question is, um, I remember growing up in, uh, in D.C., uh, schools, and they always would give us all these negative statistics about young black males. And so I'm like, oh, my God, I feel, I feel like I'm trying out f to be successful. I'm trying out for a sports team or something, you know. But there are also very positive statistics uh, about black male fathers in their interaction with their children and so forth. And I think that it's very important that with the negative statistics that are affecting our young people, we have to show the positive things so that they can see a way out and see that there is a positive path to success. I work in the, the Department of Employment Services. Uh, we're doing summer jobs right now. And so my question is, um, I have about 14 young people from Ch the Chavez schools. Um, uh, when they travel to our building, so they, they may get good education in school, but then there's the environment that they travel to. Uh, my, my building is right um, behind Parkside, yes. And so when they walk through our garage, in that garage there's al often every week a fight or so with the French charter schools across the, across the street. Um, so those are the statements. But my question is, in DCPS, there's something called the impact. And a friend of mine is under that impact. And then the teachers are stressed to when they have the master educators coming in and, and still nothing is being done. The, the scores aren't going up, going up. So how is it that we can engage families more? Um, my sons go to a private school. We are, we're, we're privileged, and so we can send them to other places. At the PTA meetings, there, the room is full. At my friend's school, uh, I won't name the public school, but the room is empty at PTA meetings. So how can we engage our community more? You said that that's very important. I just would like to know uh, how we can uh, do that. Okay, that's a challenge. Who would like to respond? I want to re respond tangentially. I mean, I think that what everybody here has said is that families are really important, and, and your statements are all... Um, key. What I want to do is, is address the tangential statement you made, and that's the impact program in D.C. And the impact program in D.C. basically rewards people who do very well in the school and, and punishes and fires people that do very poorly. Um, and the research suggests that Washington, D.C. has done better than any comparable city in the country, and that this the impact program of rewarding effectiveness and not re rewarding 
uh, ineffectiveness has been a very positive thing. So that would fit into some of the things that I was talking about and I think some of the things that Irasimo was talking about. Um, so I promoted uh, uh, expanding school choice policies as a way to en better engage families. Um, the reason I say expanding is because many Americans have access to school choice. They l choose to live in neighborhoods zoned to great schools or like your family they can finance a private education and I'm sure it comes at personal sacrifice to do that but it's a priority and parents are a child's greatest advocate. There are other families that don't have the resources to make that choice and I think that Get granting them the, the voucher or the education savings account or the, the charter school application hands over a level of agency that allows families to have some say, some sort of control over the, the decisions, the major decisions that affect their family's life. Like, I'm sure you didn't just fall into the first open private school slot. Like, you did your homework and you, you chose the one that looked like it was going to be a good fit. Um, so I think that there is an equity argument to be made for expanding that decision-making power to families that are under-resourced. Um, a second comment you made was talking about role models, and I think you raise a really good point, and it's, it's why there have been and should continue to be more conversations around diversifying the teacher workforce. There is a lot of interesting work around the role modeling effects, um, and they can be indirect or direct, but um, a child that sees someone that looks like them be successful, having graduated from college, earning an income and supporting a family, that sends a very strong signal about, well, if that person can do it, I guess people like me can do that too. Um, and I think that's an area that's ripe for, for more research, not even just in, in, in terms of outcomes like test scores or things we can measure like graduation, but more intangible things like self-esteem and self-image and aspirations to, to go on to higher ed. All right. Um, I'm, s oh, I'm sorry. Okay. No, problem, no, no problem. No yes. problem. No, go ahead. I'm very hopeful about D.C. Um, in the impact charter schools have had in our nation, but especially in D.C. I can tell you that thousands of thousands of students have benefited from having charter sc schools here in D.C., where before they didn't have a choice of going to a quality school. Many, many of them now do. That means we have more young people that have experienced success, which they go back to their communities, and, and that is definitely helpful. We still have a long way to go. And I think that the, the dilemma with schools, including the challenges I faced at Chavez, but in district schools especially, is the pressure to implement policies, right? So impact necessary is good intended but what we failed to do because there's for political reasons for lack of time pressure money's committed whatever is to revisit and see the impact that a particular initiative is having you know and and I think when when we don't do that we miss the opportunity to 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 keep working on creating the entire school, you know, just making sure that I evaluate a teacher and, you know, you're not good, get out. I don't mean it like that. But, you know, what else do we need to do that might help create the conditions or the environment for that school to be the kind of school that we want? And, 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 and is I'm just giving an example. I don't know enough of the impact, so I, I don't quote me on it. But I'm just giving it as an example. You know how effective it is in create in making sure that we we create sustainable the sustainable schools that we want because we all know I mean I've been in D.C. for 25 years and you've been around to know our educational reforms that come and go come and go and then they don't have the lasting results that we want and I think we need to have better communication now right of policymakers, researchers, those that are directly impacted by the policies to really gather more information. So in terms of engaging more families, I think the problem is we say it, but many times our actions don't show it. And if we're saying that their background matters and, and, and their influence matters, they need to be part of discussions. We need to make sure that families, communities like the ones in Parkside, 
which are still very unsafe and it has the worst social statistics you can imagine. Not because the kids don't want the same thing or because they don't want to develop their potential because parents don't want their kids to have a better education. But there's a lot going on and, and, and very seldom, or the way we do education, we leave them out. We say we care, we want their input, but we don't get their input. So I, I think is we just have to step back and say, how do, can we really make sure that we value every single voice, every single voice for the next 20 years? Because they're impacted by all the decisions that we make. All right, thank you. Um, yes, ma'am. I'm Jasmine Gary, there we go. I'm Jasmine Gary, and um, I just wanted to briefly piggyback off of that question and some of the responses and then lead into my question. <laughs> um, I think a lot of the times when we think about parent engagement, we think about the parents coming to the school and not necessarily the school going out to the community and going to the parents. Um, and some of AFT, American Federation of Teachers Locals, they do a parent home visit program that allows uh, teachers and school leaders to go out into the community and visit parents and that creates a bond so that when it comes to PTA time and things like that where we want involvement at the school level, there's more of a relationship there and that relationship is very important for parent engagement. Um, I think that it doesn't hap have to happen at choice schools. It can happen at public schools too if that relationship is built. Um, my daughter attends a uh, public school in PG County and their PTA is key to the success of their school. Um, it's a public Montessori school, so that may have something to do with it, but the PTA is very strong, and it was one of the reasons why I decided to stay in that area and support the public schools. Um, going off of parent engagement, I was very excited to see that we had an opportunity to hear from someone such as you, uh, Erisima, around Promised Neighborhoods. And I think when we look about around social programs and social policies to, um, mitigate some of the effects of uh, discrimination and poverty and things like that. It's always based around the schools such as Promise uh, initiatives, and that's important. But, and I want to hear if, if any in your, if, in, uh, if any time during your research, did you find programs that were education-based that were in existing social programs in the community, such as WIC or anything like that, or anything that um, was existing and they added an education component because the population was already there? And um, Iris, could you expound upon, for people who may not know, what the wraparound services are for the Promise Initiatives and why you feel that's so important to um, mitigate effects of poverty and um, the community issues? All right, Beth. Who wants to respond first here? Just quickly. Um, oh, God, 2008, nine. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with, uh, all, all of you are from DC, I assume, most of you. So you know Parkside, Minnesota Avenue, that area. Very needy area. So we have a school there, middle and high school. We were struggling to get strong academic uh, outcomes. And I felt responsible because I had promised the parents that we were going to offer something better. And we were just not, for various reasons, the teachers, the principal. I mean, just it was hard. And what I realized. It's harder if I don't know the kids before they come to me. We have two middle schools now, I'm sorry, two elementary schools, they closed one, now it's one, but there were two elementary schools. I said, this doesn't make any sense. I need to know who those kids are and families before they come to me. So I went to the principals and I said, let's work together. Let's get to know the, the, the families better so when they get to us, we can address their, their educational needs. When I went to, so that was the initial idea, it's just how do we, the schools do more, you know, get, get the walls down and do more. When I went to those two elementary schools, the principals told me, Mrs. Alcido, we're getting three and four year olds that are just lacking so much. And that's when we realized, you know what, no matter what we do in the schools, we're not gonna be able to get to the root of the problem. That's when we decided, and so, sort of, to do the DC Promise Neighborhood Initiative. That until we get outside in the community, 
to work with the families, those parents that are expecting and, and making sure that they're prepared when they get to, to us. And for me, that was an, an eye-opening. I thought I knew community because, you know, having to start your own charter school, you really have to be in the community. The stores, at the churches, you know, you get out there. Um, and that in itself, it was a rewarding experience, especially back in those days when the charter schools movement was starting because a lot of parents were like, huh, what, you can offer better education? How can that be possible? Now, thankfully, that's the expectation and because of the charter school movement, I think it's just we, that's what parents know that there are choices and that they can get something better. Um, so it just meant that we, we had to work with, with the ANCs, the parents, we had a, the child care centers that are in the community by you know their their local child you know how to get them to certify so they can be able to educate the the little ones more um how do we make sure that there's many times we forget and in those communities they're they're anchor institutions many times we forget that you have the coach or the tenant association president those people that impact the lives of the kids when they leave our school and i had to realize that it opened my eyes to that so at the four community centers that we have there we make sure that we brought programming to those community centers after school tutoring, you know, to make sure that the kids had the, the, the services. Obviously that's very comprehensive, very intense, very difficult to do, it involves a lot of people, a lot of partners, and you know, we're struggling with, with just doing the things that we say we we're gonna do with the wraparound services and all of that, but it is necessary, but it cannot be at the exclusion of making sure that the schools in those communities, in any community, have what I have described before, which I'm not gonna read it again, but you know, you know what I'm talking about. It can't, it has to go together. We can't sacrifice one over the other. Okay. <clears throat> Anna, did you wanna say yeah. something very quickly? Okay, just a, a quick thing. So um, when I was a teacher in Ireland, we had a position at our school for the homeschool liaison officer. And the only thing common from school to school about that position is the title, because it needed to be incredibly flexible, right? The responsibilities of that person changed from environment to environment. So they would go um, into the community, they would um, recruit students to attend this, the school, and then they would figure out what are the specific supports that our community needs. Can I offer a parenting class? Can I offer a homework club? Things like that. Um, and I think that's the strength of a charter school model, where schools have the autonomy over their budget to decide that's a role that we need to fund, that's a position that we need to hire for. And and then one really quick comment on, on integrating um, education from existing programs. That's what I see as the strength of the Promise Initiative, is that, um, yes, I'm sure the po local public school library has an after-school homework club. Um, you know, the Boys and Girls Club, I'm sure, has an educational component. But families may not be able to make the connections to see all that is available, and I see the Promise Initiative as a way to um, centralize the information so that parents can become awa aware. Okay, so I think we'll <coughs> make this uh, our time for a break. Oh. <coughs> for our, our second panel, I'm Paul Peterson. I'm the director of the program on education policy and governance at Harvard University and the editor-in-chief at Education Next. And we are about to begin our second panel, and it's a very um, uh, substantial panel, I must say. Uh, we have... Um, Oh, I don't have their bios here, but you have the bios. <laughs> so you don't need all these in introductions. We have uh, Martin West, who's a professor at the Harvard Graduate School of Education and also a research fellow at the Hoover Institution. And he will be uh, making our initial presentation, and he'll be followed by Greg Topo, who's a columnist and reporter for USA Today. Um, who will be talking about game plan for learning. And to comment on these papers, uh, we have Michael Petrilli, uh, who's here in Washington, D.C. at the Thomas B. Fordham Institute and also at the Hoover Institution as a research fellow. And Susan Patrick, who's with INACOL. Um, it's the International Association for K-12 Online Learning and better known as INACOL. So, um, uh, each speaker is going to have about 10 to 15 minutes, so that will leave us enough time to uh, discuss the issues that they bring up in their presentations. And if the panelists would like to stand here at the podium, I think it's a more effective spot than sitting there for the Q&A you can do from, uh, from where you're sitting. So let's begin with Martin West. 
So thanks, Paul, and it's uh, great to be here. Um, my task for this special issue was to talk about uh, another of the points on Jim Coleman's star that Paul referred, referred to earlier, and that was his work documenting the benefits of attending a Catholic school, especially for minority students. And uh, also to update that finding with respect to what we've learned about Catholic schools and school choice more generally uh, in the decades since he conducted that work in the 1980s. And I'll admit when I set out on that task, I thought of this as really a distinct line of inquiry for uh, Coleman, something that he took up much later in his career and was really unrelated to his equality of opportunity study. And certainly the central message, at least in terms of how people have understood the Coleman report and its findings is quite different. Uh, the takeaway message for many people from the Coleman report was that schools didn't make much of a difference when it came to students' outcomes. And here he was a couple of decades later saying that attending a Catholic school could actually make a big difference when it came to student outcomes. Uh, it wasn't all about the family. Um, and there certainly was a gap in time between when he conducted these two uh, areas of work. But as I began to read more, I learned that um, actually uh, Coleman's interest in uh, private schooling and in uh, market forces in education actually extended back to the beginning. And, uh, within a year of the Coleman Report's publication, he was already uh, writing about the challenges that it created with, for policymakers. His interpretation of it was that we couldn't rely on increasing resources alone as a way of delivering educational outcomes, but rather we had to find other ways to improve. And he went so far as to propose something very akin to a modern education savings account program as a way to try and break up what he saw as a uh, public school monopoly. So this was a long-term interest uh, for Jim Coleman. Um, but there was this gap, and he didn't have the opportunity really to pursue this interest or put some of his ideas that existed in the realm of theory to a partial test empirically until the Department of Education asked him to work on another major study that they were created, uh, this one known as High School and Beyond. It was uh, launched in 1979, not quite at the scale of the initial Coleman report, 70,000 students instead of 600,000 students. Uh, I think they learned that you don't need actually quite so many in order to draw reliable conclusions. Um, and what was gonna be different about this one were two things. One was that it was going to follow students over time as they uh, progress through high school and on into their careers, uh, but also that it would include not just public schools, which were the focus of the original Coleman report, uh, but private schools as well. And as Coleman conducted this study, uh, he decided to make that the focus of his own work with the high school and beyond data and produced a report and then uh, a series of books, uh, one of them the cover you can see there, High School Achievement, Public, Catholic, and Private Schools Compared. And uh, what he reported was that students performed at higher levels academically in Catholic schools than they did in traditional public schools, even after adjusting to the extent that he could for differences in their social background, uh, and that this advantage was particularly large for minority students. Uh, and then as he followed them over time, he was able to show that these differences in outcomes were especially pronounced with respect to high school graduation. I think it's difficult to overstate quite how startling a set of findings this was for the education research community at the time. The tacit assumption was that Catholic schools were something that parents chose out of a religious conviction, uh, usually at the expense of their students' academic success, that the real pedagogical expertise lay within the uh, public sector. Um, and that's not at all what Coleman found. Uh, of course, he was, findings were subjected to a lot of criticism, and uh, it's certainly the case that um, we've learned a lot about the dangers of drawing conclusions about the effects of attending a particular type of school from observational data like high school and beyond. Uh, but clearly, they had a major impact on the field, and I think played a role in reframing debates over the role of private schools uh, and government programs to expand access to private schools as something that could be a tool for improving academic outcomes. If you go back to a lot of the 
debates around tuition tax credit programs, uh, which were in play at the time he was writing, a lot of it was actually about staving off the decline of Catholic schools, which were losing enrollment for a variety of reasons, uh, and sheltering the public system from an impact of an influx of students. It was less about as, uh, school choice as a, as a uh, strategy for education reform. And so one of the things Coleman did was help to reframe the issue uh, in that way. Um, the, uh, I would also say that despite the fact that uh, certainly his uh, methods would not be considered state of the art today uh, and that it's become much more common to try and find opportunities to study the effects of school choice using experimental methods in particular, that uh, his basic findings about Catholic schools foreshadow what I would say as the two main patterns when it comes to uh, research on modern school choice programs. Um, and you'll recall that I said that the benefits that Ca uh, Coleman documented with respect to Catholic schools were especially pronounced when it came to high school graduation as an outcome. And I think we've learned over time that the benefits of private school attendance uh, when uh, students have that opportunity as the result of a voucher or tax credit program uh, do tend to be greatest for non-test outcomes, that is outcomes that uh, differ from standardized achievement tests. And that's particularly the case when we look at the likelihood that a student will graduate from high school and enroll in college. Uh, the second thing that Coleman's research really foreshadowed is a pattern of evidence suggesting that attending a school of choice, whether it's a private school or a charter school, uh, seems to be especially beneficial for urban uh, minority students. Um, and uh, I want to uh, try to, uh, and, and I think it's important to actually highlight these patterns because a common claim that you'll hear about the research on school choice is that the evidence is mixed. Well, yes, the evidence is in fact mixed, but it's mixed in a way that produces some systematic uh, lessons that we can learn from when it comes to uh, thinking about policy going forward. Uh, so let me try and convince you of these two basic claims. Uh, and I wanna do it uh, by illustrating how they show up in some of the most prominent research that's been done on uh, efforts to expand parental choice in education. And uh, probably the most high profile study uh, on the private school voucher side of the uh, policy debate um, has been Congress's mandated evaluation of the Washington DC Opportunity Scholarship Program. Uh, I'm using this example not just because we're here in Washington DC, but because this was one of the studies that was in fact conducted as a randomized controlled trial using experimental methods by which students uh, who applied for the program were assigned either to the treatment group that got the voucher or to a control group that didn't. And what you can see here is that if we compare the treatment group students and the control group students four years later with respect to their reading or math achievement, you see no differences whatsoever. Uh, so being offered a voucher didn't have any impact on your test score performance. Uh, you'll see there's a slight advantage for treatment group students in reading uh, that had actually been statistically significant three years into the program, uh, but wasn't statistically significant at the end of uh, the four year evaluation window. Uh, and so the best interpretation there is that it was really uh, just a wash. Well, the picture looks quite different when it comes to the outcome of high school graduation. And in particular, being offered a voucher led to a 12 percentage point increase uh, in the probability that the students would uh, complete high school. Um, and that actually using a voucher, since some in the treatment group didn't actually follow through and do so, uh, was to increase your chances of graduating from high school by 21 percentage points. So this pattern of seeing quite substantial impacts on attainment as an outcome that weren't foreshadowed by effects on test scores is something that's not just unique to this Washington DC evaluation, but has shown up elsewhere in the voucher literature. So uh, our moderator, Paul Peterson, uh, has done work on a privately funded voucher program in New York City that showed for uh, black and Hispanic students substantial effects on their probability of enrolling in and graduating from college. The latest research on the nation's longest running school voucher program in Milwaukee shows very similar patterns. No clear impacts on test scores, uh, but positive effects on the quality of the college students attend and their likelihood uh, of enrolling. So, uh, so when it comes to private school choice, I think 
uh, there's a clear pattern of seeing more favorable effects when it comes to attainment as an outcome uh, than test scores. Um, how about on the uh, charter school side? Um, well, here the uh, example study I want to use to illustrate my point actually is done in my home state of Massachusetts. Uh, Massachusetts is a interesting example on the charter school side because it's fairly representative of the nation in terms of the share of students who attend uh, a charter school, about 5% overall, uh, with a much more heavy concentration in its urban centers and in Boston in particular. Um, and also because uh, research has been done again using uh, experimental methods uh, because many of the charter schools in, Boston, in Massachusetts are oversubscribed. Uh, researchers can compare the outcomes of those that won the lottery to uh, be offered a seat and compare those to equally motivated families who weren't so lucky in the lottery process. And when uh, researchers do that, what we find is that there are quite substantial benefits in terms of the test scores of students who won the lottery uh, in urban charter schools in Boston, and that's what you see, uh, sorry, in Massachusetts, that's what you see on the left side of the slide. But if you look in the state's non-urban areas, uh, being admitted to one of these oversubscribed schools actually has a negative effect on your achievement, despite the fact that the school is popular enough to be oversubscribed. So this pattern of quite positive effects, and these are dramatically large effects, uh, suggesting that really the black-white achievement gap that, uh, that Rick uh, talked about in the uh, first panel really would be closed uh, during the time that students were enrolled in uh, middle school over a three or four year period uh, if they're attending one of these urban charter schools. Um, so very substantial benefits there, uh, negative uh, or neutral or negative effects in non-urban areas. This is a pattern that shows up in a nationwide study of charter middle schools uh, commissioned by the Department of Education. It also uh, shows up in uh, work done by the Center for Research on Educational Outcomes at Stanford University um, that shows that if you look uh, nationwide, uh, what you see at the bottom of this uh, chart is that just taking the results for math, just 29% of charters nationwide perform any better than their local district counterparts. Uh, the plurality, it's a wash, 31% of them actually perform a bit worse than their uh, local district counterparts. Um, but the picture, as you see at the top of the slide, is much more favorable uh, in urban areas. So why is this the case? Why do we see stronger results uh, in urban areas than elsewhere? Why do we see particular benefits uh, for minority students from school choice programs? Well, there are a lot of reasons, and certainly the, in the charter uh, sector case, many of the urban charter schools have been much more likely to adopt a so-called no excuses approach, uh, emphasizing strong standards for discipline, regular feedback on teaching quality, high expectations for students that seems to be a reliable means of improving students' academic uh, performance. But I think uh, Jim Coleman's interpretation would have been a little bit different. Um, he uh, thought and wrote a lot uh, towards the end of his career about the role that choice plays in American education, regardless of whether we have policies in place that are explicitly promoting school choice. Uh, he saw choice through the residential market as creating a highly stratified education system. Uh, public schools, as a result, are no longer a common institution, he said. Residential mobility has brought about a high degree of racial segregation in education, as well as segregation by income, and it is the disadvantage to our least able to select a school that continues to function reasonably well. Uh, if that's the case, then policies that uh, empower the disadvantaged with more ability to find a alternative to their local school that break the link between residential location and uh, the school that one attends uh, are likely to have the largest benefits uh, for disadvantaged groups. So since that time, there's been a lot of action in the policy arena around school choice. We've seen the emergence of private school choice programs in a number of states, often operating at a fairly small scale. Uh, we've also seen the rapid growth uh, in the number of charter schools. Um, but the overall picture, given that we still have uh, an ongoing decline in 
uh, non-subsidized enrollment in private school, especially in Catholic schools, is that there hasn't been much change in the share of the American public that is taking advantage of any alternative to a district school. That's right about 14%. So I think there's uh, still a lot of stratification and still a lot of room for policies to promote school choice to be a way of trying to make progress towards equalizing educational opportunity. So when I look at the research that Coleman initiated with his work comparing the effectiveness of Catholic and traditional public schools and the uh, generation of studies that followed, I think the implications for me are that there really is a strong case for continued efforts to expand school choice, especially in our major cities uh, where we have a heavy concentration of traditionally disadvantaged students and outcomes have uh, been persistently low. Um, so I think uh, that's one thing we can take away. I also think that uh, we've learned that the uh, benefits of school choice programs do often extend beyond what can re be reliably measured through uh, performance on standardized tests. And that suggests that we need to be cautious about efforts to regulate the choices available to families uh, based on student test score results alone. Now, I want to be careful here uh, because I'm someone who actually supports uh, testing requirements, uh, even in the case of private school choice programs. Uh, and uh, continued efforts to promote transparency so that families can make good decisions. But I'm increasingly worried about efforts to require as a sort of, uh, in order for a, say, charter school to be ex expanded, uh, for them to really be uh, able to demonstrate robust positive impacts on test scores. Um, if families are interested in attending uh, a school, if they're well informed about what's going on in the school, I think, uh, regulators should be cautious um, about imposing their judgment and thinking that they're uh, uh, in a better position than the family to um, uh, decide whether it's an environment that will keep the student engaged uh, in a way that will cause them to graduate from high school and be more likely to uh, go on to post-secondary work. So thank you very much. I look forward to the rest of the panel. Thanks, Marty. And just, just so you know, if, if things go badly for my talk, Marty was the one who invited me. And he's the one who actually got me going down this path, um, which is really, um, it's, it's really been an interesting, incredible pleasure finding out about um, Coleman's early work. So Marty talked about his later work. I'm going to talk about um, Coleman's earlier work. And when I say early, um, I'm talking about maybe six, seven years before the Coleman report. And I'm starting a stopwatch so I know how much time I have. Um, you know, it's six or seven years didn't seem like much um, between you know the, the Coleman report and what came before it. But I thought I'd use a musical analogy that you know, 1966, summer of 1966, when the report came out, um, Revolver, the Beatles, right? Um, when the Adolescent Society came out, um, Elvis, um, it's now or never. So you can see there's a slight difference between what was happening then um, and a couple of years later. So now that I've planted that, that earworm, it's now or never, we can continue. Um, so Paul, in his introduction earlier, uh, mentioned you know, the this, this spoke of this star, the five uh, points of the star, and um, he, he mentioned games, you know, Coleman's work with games. And, you know, some of you actually may have been sitting there thinking, I, that can't be right. Um, this is the Coleman. Um, well, in fact, this is something um, he was incredibly um, serious about, quite excited about, and did some really, really interesting work in, in the late 50s and early 60s. And um, I got the invitation actually to um, expand upon a chapter in my book 
um, that talks a li just a little bit about his work. Um, and it really, I just had the time of my life um, finding out more about this. You need to remember two things about Coleman um, at this point in his career. So this would have been 1959, 1960. Um, two things. He, First of all, growing up, he hated high school. Um, and he writes quite eloqu eloquently about how much he hated high school. Um, and number two, he got into the business, what I, what I consider the perfect time. Um, if you think about the late 50s, um, the baby boomers um, were just coming of age, right? The first wave of baby boomers were just coming of age. If you go back just a few years before that, 1940, the first year that more than half of American young people had a high school diploma. Sorry if I'm, am I talking too loud? Is it okay? Um, so something's happening at this time that Coleman, I think, was one of the first to pick up on. Um, we have what can only be described as the birth of teen culture, the birth of something more than just kids growing up, spending a few years in school and getting a job. Um, they were, okay, that sounds good. Okay, thanks. Give me elocution lessons too. <laughs> thanks, Paul. Um, so, so Coleman was fascinated by teen culture and he started to ask this question. Can, can teen culture explain what's going wrong in American high schools? And he found some really interesting answers, which I'm just going to sort of lay out very quickly. Um, the, the first of which was that, no surprise, if you have kids now, that teens were focused on each other. They were interested in each other. They were, they were group focused. Um, and they wanted to count, they wanted to matter, they wanted to fit in. Okay, he, some of his early uh, research, his early interviews, um, he would ask young people, what does it take to fit in? Tell me what it takes. And he, he, he had done research in quite a number of mostly Midwestern high schools. Um, and the answers he got were really revealing. Um, I was, I was kind of going over this talk uh, yesterday with my 19 year old daughter and she said, well, what were some of the answers? And, and the, the one that to me is the most kind of revealing after all these years was he said, um, he asked one girl what it took to fit in in her high school to be part of sort of the in crowd. And, this, and I'm quoting from this response, don't be too smart, flirt with boys, be cooperative on dates. <laughs> and my, so my 19 year old listens to that and she said, that's kind of rapey. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, you're kind of right. Um, like I said, he didn't much like high school. You know, and, and he, of course, you know, was born in 1926. Um, so he was looking for uh, some answers, why high school doesn't work. And one of the things he found was that um, talking to students, talking to hundreds, thousands of students, what he found was that there was this sort of essential unfairness that they saw in the system, that letter grades they, they saw as unfair. Um, why? Because it, it set up very kind of, without any sort of real fanfare, a competition between them, okay? If I had a, a, a sheet with five math questions and I handed them all out to you right now and said, okay, the best one wins, You'd do the math questions, but you'd have a certain amount of anxiety about them. You'd wonder why you weren't as good as the guy next to you or the woman next to you. And you'd kind of come to resent both me and your fellow students, unless you were really killer in math, okay? But let's say if I, and this is just kind of a silly example, but I, I think it's kind of an illustration of what he was thinking. Um, let's say if I handed that same sheet of math problems out and I said, okay, we're gonna get the scores of this side of the room and that side of the room, and we're gonna compare them. Things start to look a little differently. Um, so he started thinking about competition and specifically in the context of sports. Um, he had been a football player in high school. Doing his interviews with these young people, he realized that sports were still really, really important in their lives. Cars, 
dates, and sports are the three things. Um, I guess in music too, it's four things. Um, you know, he, he essentially um, decided that educators um, were just looking for the wrong things from young people. Um, they were looking for young people to sort of rise to this level all on their own, individually, um, and they basically didn't want to do that. Um, they were much more interested in a team goal. Um, and so he, did, so he proposed, um, both in some early papers and in the Adolescent Society, that, we, that schools replace letter grades, and I'm not, this is not, I'm not joking about this, that schools replace letter grades with interscholastic academic competitions. So just let that sink in for a second. Um, and by the way, not just in you know math and spelling, but in everything. You know, he he suggested you know home ec, <laughs> and science and history, and he felt that um, this would really recalibrate students' expectations of school and make them not only work harder but also um, enjoy the work more. Um, you know. Uh, one of, the, uh, one of the things he noted is he said, you know, take two kids sitting at lunch in the courtyard. Um, one kid doing extra work by themselves, another kid shooting free throws. And let's say that kid on, the shoot, kid shooting free throws is the guard, the point guard on the basketball team. How do, how do their classmates think about them? Well, the kid studying by themselves is sort of odd sort of an outlier, sort of why, are the, why is he doing that? The kid shooting free throws um, for the basketball team is representing us, right? If he gets better at free throws, it's gonna benefit us. Um, so he really had this big idea to replace letter grades with interscholastic competition. Um, what he said was that the athlete's achievements give a lift to the community as a whole and the community encourages his efforts. And he saw this as a possibility with academics as well. Um, shift, shift the emphasis of competition between students and make it between schools, and you'll get some really interesting results. Unfortunately, um, as we know, something happened, and that was he was asked to write what became the Coleman Report. <laughs> um, and he didn't really get to uh, spend much more time um, than just a couple of years in Baltimore working on this idea. He actually um, created a half a dozen games um, that he, tr he and a couple of researchers tried out in Baltimore schools. And maybe some of you might even be familiar with some of that work. I, I, I don't know. I haven't really dug deep into that. I did talk to Bob Slavin at Hopkins who said this was one of the reasons he wanted to um, come to Hopkins and study with Coleman was because of this work. Unfortunately for Bob, as soon as he arrived, Coleman went to Chicago. <laughs> sort of timing. Um, so let's fast forward now, okay? So 50 years later, more than 50 years later, what do we have? Um, you know, you could say we do have that vision in some sense, right? We have the spelling bee, we have math counts, we have National History Day, we have, you know, a couple of really interesting competitions, right? And they really do follow, in some sense, Coleman's prescription, right? If you get teams of students fighting against one another, they're gonna work hard, they're gonna enjoy the work, they're gonna get a lot out of it. And it doesn't matter if they win or lose. And you, you, know, you talk to even the kids who get crushed in the spelling bee, you know, to a man or a woman or whatever, however you wanna you know, break it down to be non-sexist, they say this was an incredible experience and no, I'm not discouraged. I loved doing it. Um, unfortunately, things like the spelling bee, things like math counts, things like National History Day only tap, you know, kind of this, what I'll derisively call like the 1%, right? It's a very small group of kids. Even with something like the spelling bee, which has millions of kids, it, when, it, when it gets down to the real competition, it's just a very thin sliver of kids. Um, and I don't think he'd be pleased with that. I mean, I think in a, in a way that was sort of the, the, the opposite of his vision. Um, however, a couple of people who come to the rescue, and I can thank Marty. So now, now I blamed Marty for having me here, and I'm gonna thank Marty, because uh, a couple of years ago, uh, I, I bumped into him at a conference 
just a few blocks away at AEI, and I mentioned to him that I was working on a game about um, a book about games and learning, and sort of the light went on, and, and he introduced me to one of then one of his graduate students, um, a guy by the name of Tim Kelly, who was doing some really really interesting work, um, developing software, um, and again I'm not making this up to create. NCAA style bracket competitions in math. So to get entire schools doing math against one another, okay? Um, and if you look online, you can actually find this taking place as we speak. It was, the, the original um, vision was something called Interstellar. When I met, when I met um, Tim, it's now changed its name, it's called Arete, great name of course, um, A-R-E-T-E, CC. And you can look it up now and you can see the competitions that are taking place. Um, and the wonderful thing about, I think, Tim's vision is that um, he not only has these sort of school against school competitions, but he also has class against class. So if you know, you're know you the math teacher or the English teacher or the history teacher in room one, you can have your, t your class compete with the folks across the hall. Um, and he's really got what I consider just kind of a very forward-thinking vision of, of this. Um, I'll mention one other thing, and then I'll uh, let the other folks um, speak. Um, I, one of the other uh, folks I met doing research for the book was um, a young uh, physics teacher, I'm trying to remember what he taught, physics teacher from Canada who came across the same problems as Coleman. How do I motivate my students? And this is physics, by the way, okay, so think about that. You, don't, you get to a certain point in your high school career taking physics, you should be motivated. But what he found was that the motivation just was not at the level he wanted. So what he created something called class craft. Again, something you can look up even as you're sitting here today. Um, and what it does, slightly different flavor, it uh, breaks an individual class into what he called uh, guilds. So let's say if there are 25 students in my, uh, I actually visited a lot of middle schools that were doing this, 25 students in my um, English class, I would break that class into five guilds. And the five kids in this one guild would be working together to, and he uses terms like keep each other alive. And they would score points for things like coming to school on time, doing your homework, helping one another out, um, raising your hand, you know, you fill in the blank of the behaviors you want students to display, um, and you can earn points for being in, for, for, for complying with that. And what he's found is, he's been experimenting with this for about three or four years now, what he's found is that um, the more teachers dig into this system, the more they get students involved in it, the more they care about the guild, the more they care about keeping their fellow guild members alive and helping them out, helping them with their homework, helping them stay out, get to school on time, be in class on time. And th the letter grade system, it still exists in the school, the letter grade system, they're getting graded every day, drops away from their consciousness. And they get the work done because they want to help each other. He has a great um, story he once told me, um, and, I'll, and I'll leave it at that. Um, he, he w when he was experimenting early on with this system, um, what he decided was he would pair up his math students, the strongest and the weakest, and he would tell he told them that their their grade on a test was the combination of their two grades. <laughs> um, he said it worked for a while, but it got a little out of hand. Um, but but I guess th th what I want to leave you with is that um, you know this this vision that Coleman had, um, this idea that he had that competition is you know is not a four letter word. I think is really alive and well, um, and we're starting to see it um, take shape in some really, really interesting ways. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions later on if you want to hear about some more specifics. Thanks. Wow, fascinating stuff. Oh, Greg, Greg got to have your phone. Uh, just like I have to have my phone, I, I should apologize. You see me up here on the podium with my phone. I am not checking my email. I am following the uh, Twitter stream, which is always fun to do. I like to uh, multitask. Uh, Eric, you should know you've got a lot of people on the left attacking you right now over school funding. So be sure to check that out. You'll be, it's shocking, I know. 
This never happens. Right? The, uh, we're back into the school finance uh, debates. Here it is. I also have to apologize for those of you that, that know me mostly from my Twitter picture that you'll, you'll see I'm, I'm trying to grow my hair back in right now. But uh, it, it's, I'm in the awkward Chia Pet phase of the process, so I, I do apologize for that. Uh, I want to thank Mike Frank at Hoover and Paul Peterson at, at Next uh, for putting this event on and, and having Fordham as, as a partner in it. Uh, getting to work on the Education Next team is, is one of the, my, my, the funnest things I get to do uh, in my role, and it's uh, always a, a huge pleasure. So uh, what I'm going to do is talk about uh, a little bit about these papers, but really everything uh, we've heard uh, today. So I'm going to dig back into some of the other papers as well. And this, this big question about where do we go from here, uh, you know, what, what do we do so that 50 years from now we don't come back and, and have uh, Rick give us this very depressing news about how little progress that we've made. Uh, so let's let's talk about that. First of all, I, I do want to talk about the gaps. You know, the, the surprising part about Rick's paper and, and some of his comments is that many of us are, are familiar with what uh, at least I took to be uh, kind of conventional wisdom that we have made progress closing racial achievement gaps. Certainly, we've probably a lot of us have seen the, the work from Sean Reardon, got a lot of attention a few years ago, was in the New York Times and other places uh, where he had those amazing charts that would show that the race, racial achievement gap had narrowed considerably over time, but that, that the gap by income had widened dramatically. Now, I think we, you know, maybe we can get into a little bit about why we have this disparity. I think Rick's looking mostly at, at or just at 12th grade, and Sean looks uh, more broadly at other grades as well, um, and, and maybe looking at more than just NAEP uh, and not adjusting for the regional differences. But uh, but whether you look at, at the racial gap or the income gap, let, let's certainly say, I don't think anybody would dispute that by income, we have a, a gap that not only is as wide as it was before, but arguably is getting wider uh, and shows no sign of, of getting any better. That if anything, uh, if you had to make a prediction, you'd say it's going to continue to get worse. And the reason is the kind of things that, that uh, Anna talked about in her paper, right, that we have – uh, of course, in this country, we all know, we've heard about it on the campaign from everybody, that we have growing income inequality. But that inequality uh, leads to huge differences in how children are being raised in America today. And uh, the experience that low-income uh, kids have today is vastly different from uh, the experience that their affluent peers have. And that, if anything, that experience is getting more different. Right. Everything that Anna talked about, it rings true to those of us, you know, upper middle class raising kids today, you know, helicopter parenting the, uh, or maybe put more politely, people call it concerted cultivation. That certainly sounds better. Right. <laughs> I prefer that label, um, you know, but it's an extremely intense form of parenting, of plowing resources and time and energy like it's, uh, you know, uh, if not our second job, our first job into uh, raising kids, educating them, giving them every advantage, uh, you know, and, and worrying about their intellectual and social and emotional development in homes that have plenty of resources, in homes that um, almost always have two parents that have lots of other supports beyond it, right? Very rare to see that same kind of experience for low-income kids, right? That, that most low-income kids today, most, have only one parent in the home, right? It means they're growing up without fathers or with fathers that they don't see very often. It means that they're growing up, of course, with many fewer financial resources, uh, but also uh, a parent, a single parent, right, who's now stretched much more thin, who doesn't have uh, the same time and energy uh, and otherwise, and who uh, herself, in most cases herself, uh, did not go very far in the education system, does not have as much to share in terms of how to, uh, you know, work through the, the channels of education. Uh, and, and from the, the reading the book at night to everything else, uh, those kids experience a very different, uh, different uh, type of childhood. So what do we do about that? Uh, we know that that is, that is the, the big challenge that we're facing today, is that kids are coming into school, if anything, with bigger differences than before. Uh, and even if our schools were completely equal, which we know they're not, Right, but even if, if the schools serving low-income kids were just as good as the schools serving affluent kids in this society, uh, with that kind of challenge, you'd probably uh, find that schools, again, like Coleman did, don't make a lot of difference. You know, that the kids come in and they, in terms of outcomes, it looks a lot the same as, as the differences we have on the front end. So um, 
that that's the challenge. So what do we do about this? Uh, it seems to me there, there's a couple of options. One is that we convince affluent parents to stop uh, parenting so aggressively, <laughs> right? Anybody want to raise their hand if they think that's a promising strategy? Uh, look, I mean, I think there, there's certainly arguments. If you read Annette LaRoe's book about uh, differences in parenting, you, you come to the conclusion that, you know, less of this ag aggressive parenting might actually be a good thing in terms of raising kids who aren't such jerks and, you know, uh, feel entitled and are, you know, unpleasant to be around. Um, I don't see a lot of, uh, you know, I, you see the free-range parenting movement shows me, you know, most, some signs of hope maybe that uh, some parents are trying to take it down a notch. Uh, but I, I don't think that uh, writ large we're going to see a lot of progress in that one. S second option is to help low-income parents parent more like affluent parents. Okay, ooh, now this gets tricky. Uh, Paul, we, we heard Rick say earlier that we're uncomfortable in social policy getting into the lives of families, and for good reason, right? And not just at a libertarian-leaning organization uh, like Hoover, right? I think all of us get a little uncomfortable when we uh, think, boy, how can we get low-income parents to change their behavior around something as personal and value-laden as parenting, right? Um, that gets difficult. However, I, you know, I would argue that there's, that there's some opportunities there, some things there that maybe we haven't tried yet that we should try. Certainly people talk about uh, you know, the, the, the nudging, the, some of the behavioral economic stuff that might make a little difference, the, the text messages encouraging parents to read to their kids, you know, making sure that books uh, come home from the pediatrician that, that the parents can read to their kids, home visitations when, uh, you know, even when uh, the kids are still in utero, uh, to talk about, you know, what does it mean to uh, make sure that you're providing an you know, intellectually stimulating environment, that these sorts of things, uh, it strikes me, are certainly worth trying, uh, and we might be able to do more. You know, more controversial is to say, you know, is there something we can do about this crisis, and I would say there's a crisis in the country about single uh, parent families, that can we, you know, we we've now have this, this hardened fact where most low-income kids are being raised by single parents. Is there anything we can do about that? What can we do to help low-income uh, teenagers to get on a path where they uh, will not replicate that same family structure, but it'll be more likely that they will uh, get married? Uh, on, the, on the right, a lot of interest in various pro-marriage initiatives uh, to, to encourage that. On the left, uh, tends to be more interest in, uh, in birth control as one big important thing that we could be doing more of. Uh, and, and I've come to believe that's, that's got a lot of potential. You listen to people like Isabel Sawhill, and you say, boy, you know, we could really, we have the technology today uh, where we could make it uh, much, much less likely for young women of any race or class to be getting pregnant, either in their teens or in their early 20s. And if we could uh, delay that, uh, that early parenthood, uh, that gives us a much better shot at having parents be in a place in their lives when they could uh, be, uh, provide greater resources to their kids. So none of this is easy, but I think there's still some things that we could do that we're not doing, right? So there are some, some possibilities there. And then it leaves that, that final, uh, the final big option, it seems to me, which is we could make our schools for low-income kids phenomenal, right? Uh, again, it's not enough for them to be good. It's not even enough for them to be as good as the schools that affluent kids attend. Uh, if you're talking about kids who are coming in with, uh, you know, just hugely behind in this race, uh, you know, 30 million fewer words and, you know, many fewer learning experiences from age zero to five, et cetera, et cetera, uh, if they have any shot, any shot at, at competing, at making it, at, you know, getting two and through four-year degrees and all the rest, uh, they're going to need to go to schools that are nothing short of phenomenal. And it is my view that uh, we are naive if we think that today's traditional public school system can deliver that, right? Um, you know, Marty goes into the evidence on school choice. Uh, some of this, we're going back and forth on Twitter about some of what it means. By the way, it's interesting uh, right now, Marty was talking about the Opportunity School and Scholarship Program here in D.C., Across town right now, John King is going through his Senate confirmation. He's in front of the Senate Help Committee. And there's a whole group of D.C. Opportunity Scholarship parents in the audience wearing yellow school choice scarves there uh, to demand that the Department of Education release some funding for this program as a part of getting him confirmed. Anyways, this is very much uh, on, on people's minds today. But that, that here's a, a program that shows some uh, promising results in terms of achievement, but especially in high school graduation. Uh, you see the results in Boston for charter schools being even uh, more encouraging. 
when you look at what if you're able to d start to dig in and look not just as charters as a whole or vouchers as a whole, but dig into those schools that are the highest performing charter schools or the highest performing Catholic schools, you do see schools that are bending the curve, that are changing lives, that are getting dramatically better results. You know, KIPP right now in the most recent data getting 44% of their graduates to and through college instead of 9%, which is the national average for similar kids, right? Hugely different uh, differences. So if we can do more of that sort of thing, uh, you know, then, then we've got a real shot at bending the curve. Of course, it takes a lot of time. Uh, you know, if, uh, if we want a, uh, a no excuses charter school for every low income kid in this country, we got a long way to go. Right. Uh, and, and that means both that we need a sense of urgency, but also perhaps that we need uh, to have enough patience to understand this is going to take a generation uh, for us to get there. Now, why am I less uh, you know, optimistic that traditional public schools are going to be able to get there? You know, Rick talked about D.C. public schools as a place where we do see some really promising reforms. The impact program on teacher valuations and their teacher pay reforms that really seems to have transformed their workforce. Uh, we see promising results on the NAEP, uh, for sure, uh, and, and some other indicators. So, you know, maybe D.C. proves that it can be done. Uh, now, on the other hand, people like Matt Ladner, who's also coming after you on Twitter, uh, Rick, you should know, uh, has been saying that, look, but here's D.C. that also has still one of the biggest achievement gaps in the country. That perhaps a lot of reasons why we're seeing gains in D.C. is because it's gentrifying and because actually its student population is becoming uh, more affluent. That, that helps to explain the story. Uh, but, but give me another example beyond D.C. of a big urban school system that, that gives you hope that, uh, that those systems are going to be able to provide uh, schools that, again, not just aren't failing and not just are pretty good, but are excellent, are phenomenal, are, dramatic, are significantly better, are going to be able to do what it takes uh, to help low-income kids uh, you know, break, these, you know, break the curve. And, and I just I, I don't see them. And what is it? Why is it that some of these charter schools or these Catholic schools, you know, we, we've had for, for in the 50 years since Coleman, we've seen all kinds of, uh, of studies of, you know, the excellent schools movement and others trying to look at it. And, and you, you know, it's the, and you find the same things that you, you know, they, they come up with time and again, strong leaders, it's strong curriculum, uh, you know, a culture of high expectations. You know, I mean, all the kinds of things that you think great teachers, you say, hey, we should, why, why can't we do this at scale? We should be able to replicate it. To me, it's something in the DNA of these organizations that says, we are not going to quit until we find uh, a better way of providing education. We're going to be focused on continuous improvement. You know, that you look at, at KIPP today, and it's different than KIPP was 20 years ago. The model has changed because over time they have rigorously examined themselves and, and found ways to get better and better and better, looking under every stone uh, for ideas and evidence and research and, and new insights that will help them, uh, help their kids do better, do better academically, do better socially and emotionally, uh, get ready for, for the challenges to come. I don't know how we transplant that DNA into school systems that have grown up to be big, bureaucratic, politicized institutions, right? It's, not, it's nothing against the people that work inside those systems. God bless them. They're trying to do the best they can. But the DNA of those school systems just uh, simply does not have it. Uh, and I am, I'm not convinced that you're going to be able to transplant uh, the DNA of, a, of an organization that's all about yes, we can, to organizations that, uh, that for a long time have explained why they can't, right? Uh, so that's a big, big important thing. A um, couple other thoughts, and then uh, and then we'll continue. The uh, the the gaming and the out of school stuff, the competitions. I think that has huge promise as well. Those of us that do education reform for a living, you know, we get very frustrated with trying to figure out how to either change these big bureaucratic systems or build alternatives to it. Both of which uh, takes time and has not been as effective. Suddenly you have something like academic games that perhaps you could do outside the structure of schools entirely. You don't have to actually recreate these systems. You don't have to figure out all these hard programs necessarily. All, you know, what you've got to do is figure out a way to provide opportunities for kids when they're not locked up. Uh, in the big bureaucratic systems. And that, to me, shows uh, a whole lot of potential. If you haven't yet, you should read the Amanda Ripley article that's out in the Atlantic right now about math competitions. Again, incredibly promising that there's a lot of this. That might be changing the culture in some schools where suddenly it is cool uh, to be smart uh, because those smart kids are getting to participate in some pretty amazing competitions and, and win those competitions. And finally, leave you with one last thought. 
if we're going to break the curve, if we're going to get dramatically better results, I think we have to find a way to have honest conversations that when we focus on trying to help, quote, all kids make it, that's getting in the way of helping more kids make it. Okay. Uh, you know, one of the findings, wh when you look at the findings of Catholic schools, of course, the questions have always been, well, was it the school or was it something about the kids that were in those schools? Were those, was there selection bias? Was there something that the parents choosing to put their kids in Catholic schools, that explains why they got better results. And, and surely that was a part of it, right? We couldn't hold for that back then. Now we can do it a little bit better. Uh, but I don't think anybody would try to tell you that there's no selection bias in schools of choice, right? And, and the left sometimes will say, well, that's, that's a big problem. That's a lifeboat strategy. You're not helping everybody. You're only helping a few, right? I would argue that we do not know how to help everybody. We do not know how to help the very, very, very hardest cases, the you know, most, most, most disadvantaged kids. Um, but there are a whole set of kids and families out there that are poor, that are disadvantaged, that face very big challenges, okay, but maybe aren't the hardest cases, that we are starting to figure out how to help. Uh, and when we help them get into a high quality charter school or a great Catholic school and they are successful, to me, that is a big win. And we can't let the fact that we haven't figured out how to help everyone stop us from helping more of those kids and helping some. Thank you. Nothing like being last at the uh, end of a, a really great discussion where people are taking in lots of words and ideas. Um, I'm Susan Patrick, and I feel a little bit like a maybe a fish out of water, um, but I work for a nonprofit called INACL, and I work with those uh, educators in um, public education that are, despite all of the odds, despite all of the barriers, are trying to rethink how we approach public education and what our system can do to not be so focused on a system of schooling, but a system of doing what's right for each and every child. Um, we work across the US in all 50 states. Like I said, I work mainly with public school districts, but we also work with charter schools, with research institutions, with higher ed researchers trying to bridge policy and practice. Um, and we work with policy makers that are um, in search of solutions and ideas and trying to get around, get, get over the rhetoric of the partisanship that we've had in this space for so long. Um, I also work with more than 50 ministries of education around the world. And one of the things that I'm really starting to see when I'm overseas is that most other educational systems start with values. This is really hard for us to do because we're in a, you know, in a local um, education system where we have 15,000 school districts and 50, you can't, just can't put in values. But communities drive the values of their local school systems and local school systems and communities right now have, an, have a potential of impacting state policy given the federal policy flexibility that just opened up on December 10th in a way we haven't had in decades in decades in this country. There is, there is a huge opportunity at hand. When other countries focus their school systems on how do we make every single child globally competitive, how do we focus on the competencies, the knowledge, and the skills that every child would need, and how do we focus on the fact that every child can learn, and we will provide the supports to bring equity to every every child and ensure that they don't advance until they get those supports and develop mastery. Now some of us might call that switching from a time-based system generally to a competency-based system, but this is a conversation that's happening, happening around the world. So there are, there are three ways on looking at this question. The questions that Coleman raised, and you may have seen the quote, where he says, it's not very motivating to rest on a curve. If you've been sorted and ranked in the school system your whole life, where you may come in and not have the system meet you where you are, right? What I'm saying is, we know that students are coming in in different places. What does our system do to address that and be honest about it? 
we know right now that we have ninth graders coming into ninth grade at a fourth grade math level or a fifth grade reading level, and our policies of the past have forced us to fire hose that child with content instead of addressing the gaps that exist. And that's been across, across the K through 12 continuum. Why well, Todd Rose just wrote a book called The End of Average. And this myth of average that we've built our whole system around to organize, to sort kids, to rank kids, to judge them on A to F. How great is that? We have kids going through with A's, B's, C's, D's. You slide through with D's and C's. What is the percentage of gaps that you build on from year to year to year? So when I think about the innovations that are possible today, the technologies that our teachers and our students can have in their hands to help pinpoint those gaps and personalize learning for each student. It's not about online learning. It's not about blended learning. It's not about technology. It's about how do we do innovation for equity? Because we have some of the tools to let us address these huge problems that have persisted in our system and it's going to take a lot of creativity and a lot of creative design work. But when you start, we ask, are we designing our schools based on how students learn? Are we helping to provide supports to educators and students to help students learn best? And are we supporting a system that's very comfortable sorting and ranking kids and saying, wow, you're really great, look at your GPA? Are we asking for a system that has a personal learning plan for what the knowledge and skills are that students need to know throughout K through 12 and that a diploma actually means something with the evidence of that learning throughout? How are we graduating? If we graduating students that don't have the skills to go get jobs or go be successful in college? Because we're letting that happen in our system because we're we're accepting that our transcript on our diploma with our A to F grades and our time-based system that's sorting kids out is good enough, and it's not. If we're going to focus on equity and doing what's right for every single child, we have better tools at our hands, but ultimately it's about educators designing instructional models that support each student's needs. And I feel so grateful because I'm working with people in schools all over the country that are really changing what is possible. And they are in some of the, of the toughest neighborhoods. There's a school in Chicago Public Schools where the teachers and the, um, and the principal of that school have designed a learning model starting in high school. When you come in, you're assessed. Our, our most selective private High schools will assess students when they come in and place them. They're assessed and the, they pinpoint where is that, where is each student's needs? How do we make sure all of our children fill in those gaps and they're successful? And they have over a 90% graduation rate at a school that had an 8% graduation rate five years ago. How do they do that? They get the tools in their hands to pinpoint where those gaps are and they help bring them along, they give them supports, they use reading specialists and special ed specialists. So let me just go back. It's, it is possible for us to think differently about what we want our system to do. And on December 10th, when the president signed the Every Student Succeeds Act, it does give flexibility back to our communities and to our states. And if we're gonna leave this in the hand of our state departments of education, which have very limited capacity and may be full of people with privilege and not give an opportunity for our localities to come together with our communities, civil rights leaders, and say, what do we want success to look like? We have the opportunity now for multiple measures. What do those measures look like that determine success? What does that growth look like? And is the unit of school the right unit to be measuring, or can we make sure that each and every child has the evidence of that learning throughout and roll up that data and validate it in different ways. Because now, summative tests are allowed, but at different times and grade level. They can be interim and more modular. We can rely on performance-based assessments and help build 
capacity in the system, as well as computer adaptive. So this isn't about the technology. This is about having a data-rich environment around how students are learning and expanding educational opportunities and pathways for student success so that every student, when they graduate, we're asking, what does success look like for that student and what does success look like for our communities and our states right now have the opportunity to design next generation accountability models that can align with true student-centered learning. And in the law, there are provisions for innovative assessment pilots that really align to doing competency-based pathways, as well as opening up Title II, what do we want effective teaching to look like? This is all open and on the table right now and we've got to start the conversations in communities and in states. So Coleman, looking at educational opportunity, this comes from the Office of Civil Rights at the US Department of Ed. Only 50% of US high schools even offer calculus, have a calculus teacher. 63% offer physics. In US high schools, those with the highest percentages of black and Latino students only 25% do not even offer Algebra 2, and 33% do not offer Chemistry. This is still going on today. So you can go back 50 years to Coleman, but we have huge gaps in terms of educational opportunity. The programs that I started working with 10 years ago, like Florida Virtual School, um, the Maryland Online Learning Program, the state programs, the district programs that offer supplemental online courses, licensed teachers that are trained to teach online, delivering courses so that any student anywhere can have access to the best teachers using technology and connecting and doing this work. Why do we still have these numbers today when we know that we can open up access for every student? The University of California system Colorado State, I'm, I'm sorry, California State and UC system requires A to G requirements. These courses in order have to be on your transcript in high school to apply and get accepted to the UC system. 40% of high schools do not offer the full range of A to G courses in the state of California. So if you're in one of those high schools, your opportunities are limited. How, when we have ready <laughs> solutions, Connecting teachers, teaching online, and courses, can we not make this available? So this is a uh, community group and parents that are in LA that are protesting because they want their students to be able to access the A to G courses so they can be college ready. This comes from USC Hybrid High, which is a um, personalized competency-based new high school model and what they found for students coming into the ninth grade from middle schools all across Los Angeles is that not a single student was ready to enter the ninth grade level, even though some of their students have been getting A's and B's over many, many years. Most of their students were at a third grade, a fourth grade, or a fifth grade math level, and the range was, was huge. So they had to come up with a concept about how to talk to students about this honestly and support them as part of we're going to help you get there. This isn't about judging you or fire hosing you on grade level so you can get ready to take a test at the end of the year, but so we can build your knowledge and skills so you can be successful. And they called it dipping your toe into the math stream. When you dip your toe into a river, it never comes in and out of the same place twice, right? So students understood this and they got the supports and they're helping them fill in those gaps to be successful. Because the tools that we have now with online learning are inherently modular. So students that start, the students started in the bottom three, the bottom three um, students in the class, once they work and fill those gaps, and it may take a little bit longer, but they can accelerate. This is what we know about how the brain works, how students learn. Once they catch up and fill in those gaps, they can accelerate and become one of the top five students in the class. All students can learn, and when we have a system that recognizes that all students can learn and takes more care in looking at the actual data around how students are learning and asking for high-quality evidence 
of that student learning. So through student projects, through pro competency-based progressions. And I'll just, I'll just wrap up here. This um, S-curve is a, from Jason Zimba. It symbolizes Algebra One, But students learn on a learning um, progression or learning trajectory. And there are groups of skills that are clustered. And you can learn using a textbook. You can learn using an online um, game competition across schools. You can learn using online learning modules. You can learn peer-to-peer -peer in many different ways. So why can't we organize our schools around bringing students what they need to learn in different ways and demonstrate that and collect evidence along the way rather than just capturing the gaps at the end? Why should a student go through an entire Algebra One class to find out that they have an F at the end of the year, so they have to retake the whole class in the summertime. We should be focused on the competency-based level, so it's unit recovery, not whole course recovery, and make sure that the gaps don't exist by the end. So there are lots of different models out there where students are, are working in smaller groups and guilds and getting direct instruction from teachers on the side. There are lots of different models. This is from Minnesota where students are doing their own work. They're doing group work around the edges, doing projects that may span a semester, doing big ideas, doing exhibitions, working in their communities, bringing back projects um, that are relevant, that are working with museums, that are working 20% of the time in internships and developing those skills so that when they graduate and when they come out, not only do they have the academic knowledge, but they also have the other skills they need. They have some work experience. Sometimes they're even getting some paid work experience to help at home. You can bridge formal and informal learning to competency-based systems, and assessment's always open. And it's around assessment for learning so that it's meaningful for the student and it's meaningful for the teacher and giving feedback on how are we doing, are we there yet, do we have mastery, are we ready to move on. So moving from a time-based system to a competency-based system is here. In 2012, there were about a handful of states that were moving in this direction to provide flexibility from seat time. There are more than 43 states now that have enacted po competency-based policies and I just I just leave on this to say, with the new federal law, the Every Student Succeeds Act, it is the opportunity to define what success looks like first, then ask the questions on what are those multiple measures for our next-gen accountability systems. This is the time to shape the future of education in America, and there are opportunities to innovate, but we must do innovation for equity. Thank you. We have uh, 15 or 20 minutes left to uh, discuss the many issues that have come up from uh, school choice, competition, charter schools, blended learning, digital learning, games. Who has a question? Yes, sir. Uh, for Mike, you mentioned on um, are there any school districts in the country that we could look to as a model? I was just wondering if you could comment on what might have been happening in recent years and anyone else with, who's very quantitative, I guess, in New Orleans after the charter kind of remake of the system. Has that worked out well or are there still a lot of problems there? Uh, I think it has both worked well and there's still a lot of problems. Uh, so the answer is yes. Uh, so, you know, the um, hurricane in Katrina provided an unusual window of opportunity for making some pretty fundamental changes to the governance structure of schools there. Uh, the state created an entity known as the Recovery School District to es essentially take control of the schools while they were getting them back up and running. Uh, and that entity then uh, really use as its strategy and uh, attempt to convert all those schools gradually into an entire charter uh, system. Um, as they've done that, they've wrestled with a lot of the, um, I would say, sort of thorny design challenges of how you make a uh, universal system of school choice work and how you ensure that schools are uh, being fair in admissions, that they're administering discipline in a reasonable way. Uh, and. I think they've come up with some quite clever solutions to those problems. 
Uh, it's a system that was performing at very, very low levels uh, prior to the storm. And the best research evidence, which you can read about in Education Next, actually suggests that it's made uh, substantial gains of about uh, between 0.2 and 0.4 standard deviation, so uh, uh, larger than we've seen system-wide in a sort of entire district at that same scale. Um, and so I think the, the picture is quite optimistic. And I, and I should say, uh, you know, when I was talking about the issue of charter schools and private schools and policies to promote access to those, uh, really following on in the tradition that Coleman started, I was talking about th that through the lens of what's the effect of having that opportunity to enroll in a school of choice relative to your default alternative, um, which is, of course, one question you want to answer when you're thinking about the debate over school choice. But the other is, what's the effect of these programs on the system as a whole, right? What are the systemic effects in terms of a competitive response or in terms of equitable sorting? Um, and so to critique Coleman a little bit, uh, he had a very narrow view of the type of research uh, that he was doing uh, on this topic, and it's places like New Orleans where I think we've learned about what, what it would take to uh, make this work in a more systemic way. Yeah, I mean, I, I am optimistic about New Orleans, but I would put it in the charter bucket for sure. Yeah. Yes. Hi, Reggie Felton again. Uh, again, uh, the things that we can do, innovation for equity, or certainly uh, that's the right direction. That's where we should go. That's where most of us want to go. We talked about ESSA and the fact that the states now have the flexibility, and yet when we look at state structures for bringing about change, certainly innovation, they don't necessarily have it. Can any of you comment on, you know, what, how do you, how do you get, well, you know, if you had how to get there, you wouldn't be here. But how do we actually make that happen more and more? We've been talking about you don't need 12 years, you need whatever it takes for a student to move. You know, you need to get away with the old schedule in terms of calendar and daytime. We talked about uh, teachers and the use of uh, adjunct professors to really help. I mean, all these things are out there in discussion. What's, what's the key to move it from talk to actual committed action on the part of a state, state legislatures, governors, those who have now the authority? Susan, you're, you're the person on the ground. Yeah, and I'll, um, I'll start this by actually pointing to something that um, Mike and Fordham did, which was they had a design competition for states, localities, researchers to say what should next generation accountability look like. And, and maybe I haven't talked to you about this, yeah. but maybe some of those designs were, might have been interesting, but not as forward thinking as you would have expected in this. Um, so we haven't had this conversation. but. I actually thought that was an interesting idea for states that don't necessarily have the capacity, but actually to do their own design competitions with communities and districts and people across the state, but to ask the question first, what do you want success to look like? And then get to the, what does next generation accountability look like? Some states, even with limited capacity, um, some states in New England and Colorado right now, are having or have had a conversation over the last two years around what should success look like. And it's been remarkable across different communities, different geographic regions, groups, parents, students, teachers, um, workforce, how similar those conversations have resulted in creating a reframe that has been less or not politicized just about what we wanna see for kids and then having that drive, how can we think about this for a new accountability system? And there are some resources out there, um, Linda Darling Hammond's work to um, uh, multiple measures, probably the longest, most stable um, multiple measure next-gen accountability system in, in the world is in Alberta, Canada to our north. So there are some examples that can help people get started, but I think the core is having this conversation around what does success look like? And then what is the data to support that? So we get away from this um, purposes of data and have it really focus on um, the core for building student learning and continuous improvement. Mike, you wanna add to that? 
I, I, I'm kind of curious about some of the, what other people on the panel think about this. You know, one, one issue that hasn't really been raised, I don't think, today is the topic of career and technical education. We've talked about high schools have come up a lot. And my understanding is that Coleman was skeptical of a lot of that, and back then for good reason, that the old Vogue Tech was pretty awful and racist and classist and, you know, dead ends. Uh, many of us now think that high quality career and technical education has really come around and in many cases is more effective than many college. I'm just curious sort of what, uh, what role we see those kinds of programs having in terms of student success uh, and, and if that should be a part of our system to have, you know, an option at the high school level to go into a route where you're really focused on, you know, going a more technical route, aiming for technical post-secondary degrees, but, but giving up on the classic academic track um, you know, is, is that something that uh, that we should pursue? And how would where would how would Coleman feel about that? Does it have to be an either or? <laughs> right? We're so caught up in our course structure and subject structure. If we really did redefine Carnegie units as competencies, then you could get the core of what you need for college and career ready, right? And um, get certifications and coding and programming or, or other fields. There's no reason it has to be an either or, but our, our structures are just so set up like that right now. Other comments, questions? Yes, sir. Yes, uh, I'm Pete Kirstenhauser. I'm from uh, Great Falls, Virginia. I ran for the school board in Fairfax County last year. And so far I've heard all of you talk about closing achievement gaps, trying to raise the achievement of low achieving students. Uh, Susan, you got a little bit more into other students. Some of your graphs showed general achievement, but almost all your discussion has been about how do we raise these low achievers. Uh, I ran for school board because I'm a pissed off parent. I didn't win. I dodged that bullet. <laughs> <laughs> However, one of my colleagues, one of my friends won, and she asked me to be the uh, advisor of her council. And so I got some collateral damage, even though I did dodge the bullet, and that's the one that she caught. Uh, but a big concern that parents that I talk to in my area, and it's an affluent area, is what are you doing for my kids? My kids are good students. They're middle, they're middle range. They're upper range. Why is it that my kids get stuck in, in classrooms with 30 students and more, and their teachers, they get to that mid-career point, and they leave for greener pastures somewhere else because we're not paying them enough, and we're overworking them with, with that many students in a class. And, you know, I, I am concerned that you all are looking at the shiny ball, which is how do we raise low achievement, instead of how much more would we get as a society if we were to take those same resources and invest them into those students that are in the middle and the top of the ladder because they can climb that much higher. So I want you to talk about that, because budget's a zero-sum game. You can't keep pouring resources at one end of this distribution, but that you rob the kids at the other end of the distribution to do it. All right, so I heard, I heard Greg talking about games <coughs> that seemed to me to be the kinds of things that would be attractive to your most talented students at school. So wh what do you think about that idea, Greg? Well, e even short of that, I mean, you know, w I think one of the things that Coleman w really, really did have on his plate was the idea of equality um, and, and and engagement for all kids. So, you know, he didn't talk about, you know, uh, my ideas, the, the, the games that I'm suggesting um, are just for certain kinds of kids. Um, you know, if you, if you read what he wrote about it, this particular topic, and, and I can't say, you know, I haven't read Coleman widely, but I mean, what I have read, the research I have read, he was interested in everyone. <laughs> he wanted to raise everyone's achievement. Um, and, and the dilemma that he started from, as I said in my talk, was, you know, there's underachievement sort of across the board that, you know, essentially nobody liked high school, your kids and the other kids. <laughs> um, so there, there, he really didn't see much of a separation. I, I, I kind of liked high school. You kind of liked high school? Yeah, I liked I did. Yeah. You liked high school? I was Mr. Spirit, yeah, but that's another story. <laughs> but I, no, but I think, I mean, I think to your point, you know, I mean, I, obviously there are a lot of parents out there who are, who, 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 who are saying, you know, this focus on the achievement gap is hurting my kids' chances. Um, and, and I think just in sort of in the spirit of this panel, or you know, this event, I mean, I think Coleman would say, right on, brother, you know, let's find a way, let's, let's find a different way to, to, to slice and dice this, this issue. 
Yeah, look, I it's certainly sympathetic to what you're saying, and uh, I would encourage you to go to the Fordham Institute's website. We've done a lot of work on high-achieving kids over time. So, you know, and my colleague and, and former boss, Checker Finn, who wrote a great book about, uh, about high-achieving kids around the world, and I think we did an event here on, at Hoover about it. You're right, though. It, it is, you know, there are some things that are zero-sum games. I mean, funding certainly is one of those things. And, uh, and look, we have to have tough discussions in our country. I mean, it is still the case that in a lot of places we're spending more money on affluent kids than we are on poor kids. Uh, and, look, I, I, I'm a conservative. I can't justify that, right? Um, you know, so uh, I think it, it is appropriate for us to be particularly concerned with uh, making sure low-income kids have great schools because, again, they are getting the shaft uh, in so many ways uh, outside of school. Uh, but that doesn't mean that everything is, is you know, all well and good uh, for other kids at the same time. I, I, just I, I, I do have to add a comment, and that is the uh, if you start doing comparisons between the United States and other countries, and you look at kids that come from families which have – uh, the parents only have a high school education, both of them. 17% uh, of them are proficient in math, which places them at about 25th among the industrialized countries of the world, 32 top industrialized countries in the world. They're number 25th. If you look at the families uh, who have a college degree and you look at their children, one of the parents has a college degree or maybe both of them do, if you look at them, they do much better. The 43 percent are proficient, but they look very even worse when you compare them with other countries around the world. Other countries around the world do better with the best educated, the kids coming from the best educated families, and other countries around the world do better with the children from the least educated families. So the problem with our educational system is not exclusively with the poor kids or the disadvantaged kids or with the minorities. It's a much more general problem. So I'm very sympathetic to what you have said. And my thought has always been the easiest way to think about what's going on in many other countries and not going on in the United States is other countries have an examination system when you finish secondary school that's very important for your future career, whether it's going on to the university or going on into the workplace. And we don't do that. We just, you just graduate from high school. And there's no clear set targets like they have in many of the provinces of Canada or in Finland or in uh, uh, France or England or Australia. I was just down in Australia. Every student in Australia knows exactly what they have to do in high school. And they do a lot more and they are much more successful. So I don't think we need more money. We just have to clarify for students what it is they need to at attain. And I'm rather attracted by the idea of using games to get there. <laughs> so. In All defense right. of the yeah. conversation, yeah. I th yeah. we are commemorating the 50th anniversary of the Equality of Educational Opportunity Study. So you know, this was an equity-oriented uh, uh, report that you know challenged the, the nation uh, with some facts about its education system. So I think that explains a, a lot of the focus. But I, I'm very sympathetic to the point you're making as well. And I would just say it has important political implications because as long as education reform is framed exclusively around closing achievement gaps, it's going to be hard for a lot of people to see what they're uh, getting out of it. Uh, and in fact, they may feel threatened by it. So, um, so I agree and I think uh, many of us on this panel and have been part of the conversation today have uh, done work that hasn't been our focus today related to that. All right, one last question. Yes, ma'am, in the back. <laughs> right next to you, right below the 60th. So this is more of a comment. Um, as, as a gentleman just spoke uh, just r a minute ago, Martin just said, um, that the purpose of this event today, and, and now he's walked outside of the, the room, um, is to talk about the inequities that exist in our public education system today. And we can get him back if you want. Yeah, no, that's okay. I did not to discount his comments about, you know, how are you helping some of my kids from an affluent community who are not getting certain resources? Um, and some of those resources might be, I don't know if they're delegated elsewhere or, or whatever the case may be. Um, when you look across the spectrum of the, the history of this country, low-income students and students of color, the term minority to me is pretty pejorative, even though people continue to use that term. Um, students of color have long been given the shaft. 
And so it's, it almost reminds me of the kind of the argument of reverse discrimination of how, you know, affluent white kids are, are losing a spot or a seat because it's being given to a child of color. Um, even if you are a parent who lives in an, in an affluent community, you are more likely to have the cultural and the social capital, the resources and the knowledge to get your student over a particular threshold or to get them into a great school or you know, to provide them with the equipment that they need to succeed in life. Um, and students of color simply don't have that. So I think not that we want to discount the needs of those students, by and large, the vast majority of students of color in this country continue to be slighted. And I think when we kind of frame things from a reverse discrimination perspective, I think it kind of muddies down the issue even more. It kind of discolors it and makes it semi-illegitimate. It's interesting, I just wrote a story yesterday about some new uh, Pew uh, research findings that said that Hispanic and um, African-American families uh, if you survey parents, they at a higher rate say that a college education is important to success in life than whites do. And there's some interesting, you know, questions that follow on that. Well, why, you know, why is that? Um, but, you know, to your point, um, I mean, it, it, it's really interesting to think in those terms that maybe it's not, uh, and these are, by the way, are parents who statistically are less likely to have a college degree themselves. <laughs> So it opens up a lot of really interesting questions. Well, I hope our discussion today has opened up the conversation so that we can think about ways in which we can improve our educational system for all children, black, white, Hispanic, Asian, people of color, people pale, and that we can um, work together in a nonpartisan way, in a bipartisan way, so that we can have a quality educational system yet in the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you.